Hello and welcome to another episode of the Cryptid Ramblers podcast. I'm Scott and my partner in all things cryptid, <laughs> Callum. Hello, how you doing? Yeah, good man. How about you? Yes, yeah, not too, uh, yeah, not too bad. Interesting uh, couple of weeks, as you know, but yes. uh, yeah, nice to have had this as a little, uh, little escape, shall we say? Yeah, so, I know, right? uh, yeah. Good and excited to get into this one specifically as well. Yeah, so, well, uh, as you guys yeah. will have known by now, um, this is a follow-on from the previous episode because, yes. quite frankly, we found so much yes. that we couldn't actually just put it into one episode. And we, by the time no. we got to the end of the episode, we was like, actually, I wanted to talk about this and I wanted yeah. to talk about that, you know, and it was, um, it just made sense just to carry on with it, really. Yeah, exactly. It was, it was a case of either making a super long, um, you know, episode in what is now the part one um, or yeah, as we realized that there was a lot more content that we could have included. Um, but yeah, just didn't want to, didn't want to mm. make an extra, extra long episode. <laughs> no. It's bad enough as it is. Oh, no, right, yeah. <laughs> Never mind with the additional, but yeah, we've obviously found that we've got enough compelling info to bring to you guys for another uh, episode. So yes, yeah, is part another two. Another exciting episode of the Cryptid Ramblers. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but, Absolutely. Um, but yeah. But of course, before we do get into that, so we've got to give a big shout out and uh, another appreciation for our con- for their continued support yep, through Patreon. Absolutely. So thank you, yeah. James, Justin, and Manika. <laughs> thank yeah, you very much thank for you. your help, and uh, thank you very much for your continued support. Yeah, absolutely, um, much appreciated. And you guys, you can uh, like, subscribe, share. That's a, one of the best ways you can support us. Yeah, absolutely. But another way is that you can go to. <laughs> Buy that merch.co.uk you forward can. slash cryptid dash ramblers. Yep. And you can pick up some of the, the new merch that we've uh, that we recently dropped a couple of weeks back. Yeah, that's right. Um one that Callum is beautifully modeling. Right modeling. Now. He is right now. M- modeling the, the shaved monkey range. <laughs> and I have finally got a raging gorgon. Oh, look at that. There we go. Excellent. <laughs> well, I'm like so it. glad that I can yeah. say that out in public. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> And there's context this time. There is actually context <laughs> yeah. this time. <laughs> and uh, our uh, Patreon, top tier Patreon subscribers will be able to see such see that, merch yeah. as well. You lucky things. I know, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but um, yeah, let's, uh, let's get into the episode. Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I ended up finding this book called Vampires Are. Uh, yes. It's by Stephen Kaplan. Um, and my God, is it hard to get. I, I can't find it anywhere. And I've yeah. even got a few unauthorized websites yep uh, and they don't even have it that's mad like, isn't it, it just it's nuts yeah so I, mean, I i knew about this book um quite a while ago when i was really really into the vampire thing and yeah was watching all the vampire films and flicks and yeah, reading course, the books yeah. and, and whatnot yeah um and this was one of those books that i've been wanting to read for a long time mm. because it was first published in 1983 Oh, right. And from okay. what I understand, that was the only time it was published. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Um, there are hardback copies out there, but they're like two, three hundred pound. Yeah, um, exactly, well, probably yeah. more actually when you you take into account import costs because they've got to come from the states. Yeah, um, shipping and import and customs and yeah. all those fees. Yeah, yeah. So I've 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 managed to get an incomplete copy from various different files. Right. Um, okay. So I'm going to be bringing that to you guys. Uh, yeah, and I'm looking forward to it because until you sort of mentioned it in our usual sort of weekly chat, mm. um, I wasn't aware of the the book or or even Dr. Kaplan himself. Mm. So uh, yeah, I'm I'm interested to see kind of what his findings were because it's um, sort of a lot of real world yes. stuff, isn't it? Interviews and, and yeah. that kind of thing. I mean, I'll, I'll give you a quick rundown on it and, and on who Stephen Kaplan is. He he wanted to get into the study of vampires but more so from a psychological aspect rather than the supernatural creature. Right. Um, so people who thought they were vampires. Yeah. He was really interested in in that side of it. So he, the his research goes down the actual talking and interviewing with people who believe themselves to be vampires. Yeah. Um, and the, the various different cases that he's been able to compile. Um, gotcha. I've got some great ones. I've, got, I've actually got one that details... Um, and Elizabeth, who believes that she is a vampire that is over 400 years old. Right, okay. But I'll save that till a little bit later on in the episode, <laughs> yeah. because that is a, it yeah. is a doozy. Yeah, I'm looking forward to, yeah, you, you sort of gave a, you dropped a few breadcrumbs in our weekly yeah, call, yeah. so I'm excited to hear about the full, yeah, sort of ins and outs of, um, 
yeah of her and yeah and, and what his findings are mm. so yeah but be a good one but before we do get into uh Stephen Kaplan's vampires are yes um you got a few bits yeah it's just a couple of bits that I wanted to go over um just in uh, kind of follow up from the now part one um episode um for those that have listened um you may remember that we were talking about where some of the uh, kind of vampire uh, sort of tropes have come from in terms of, you know, how you banish or, you know, kill, you know, sort of a vampire. Yeah. And I know you came up with uh, an option, but I know that I said that I couldn't, I couldn't find a, a reason as to why um, garlic was part of that legend. Mm. Um, but it, it turns out I actually had, uh-huh. um, I just admitted <laughs> it, <laughs> I just admitted it from my notes. Gotcha. Um, and so it was only when going back through them, because what I didn't want to do was double up mm. on anything that I'd found for this one. And as I was going through, I thought, oh, no, I did find it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I just wanted to mention that. I mean, you know, the listeners might already know, um, you know, themselves, but I'll I'll offer it up, um, you know, anyway. But uh, we did mention, again, if anyone remembers, a condition um, co- called porphyria, mm. um, which uh, I think I mentioned it along the lines of the uh, severe skin irritation. And right, so when yeah. they when people would go out into the sun, they would get rashes and, and sort of skin blisters. And, and mm-hmm. that's where the whole idea of um, vampires not, you know, being able to go in daylight yeah. has come from. Well, the same condition has another symptom, which is a severe intolerance to food. And one of those foods is, of course, garlic. Oh, I see. Um, and so that is where that's come from. So the combination of, of intolerance of garlic and, mm. you know, and sunlight um has lent itself to what we now know as the you know sort of the, the legend um if you like in, in how you certainly will get rid of a vampire yeah, <laughs> yeah. It certainly adds to the symptoms of a yes. vampire yeah and such. okay cool. no, absolutely um and as a sort of side note to that i guess um it was believed um many years ago in europe um that vampires were created by a blood disease um Therefore, a powerful antibiotic would kill or cure a, a vampire. And, of course, back in that, that day, um, garlic was a strong antibiotic. Ah, oh, of course. Cool. So, again, administering garlic uh, yeah. to someone who they believed was um, a vampire by way of just this blood disease is also where it may kind of lend itself to, you know, sort of the, the legend. That's kind of cool. Um and just staying on the uh, the garlic theme. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, again, you know, sort of back in back in to deer, um, rabies was also quite um, prominent, mm. and people infected by it would have a hypersensitivity uh, to smell, um, mm. and this would of course include the strong smell of garlic. So again, having that kind of intolerance yeah. to garlic, whether it be the the taste, the smell, or, or whatever, is another that makes reason. sense as well, doesn't it? That yeah, sort of lent itself to the uh, the the legend of why they kind of cool. hate garlic. Yeah, a little bit of a um, little bit of a, 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 a like a side note there. Yeah, um, there's a bar in Soho. I don't right. know if it's still there now, but years ago I went to it. Yeah, it was called mm. Blood and Garlic. Oh, okay, and it was re- it was really cool. <laughs> it, like everything, uh, every single shot had garlic in it as well. So if you had like a Bloody oh, Mary Jesus, or something yeah. like that. Yeah, it was you'd have garlic, garlic in it. but it was all done up like that Halloween sort of style, right. vampire crypt sort of thing. Okay, and like you go downstairs into the basement, yeah, and you you basically you sit around a casket. The casket is your coffee table sort of thing. Right. Okay. Oh mate, it was so That's cool. cool. It was so. Yeah. Cool. I don't know if it's still there, but if you are, shout out to Blood yeah. and Garlic and so Shout out to them. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really cool place. Three shots would be appreciated. Oh, indeed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, just a couple of other bits. I think are probably more relevant as a follow-on to the part one because um, obviously we're going into something very different in this episode. Mm. Um, but um, I found a, a, a very kind of short story um, regarding a the, the belief um, that there was actually uh, a vampire first recorded that was earlier than the examples that we found um, in in the first sort of episode. Oh, really? Yeah, it's obviously aside from the <clears throat> um, uh, Lilith oh, course, story, yeah. obviously excluding that yeah. from the good book, um, but in terms of actual <laughs> like, real world um, stuff. But the, yeah, this um, predates what we found, and it, um, it involves a, a chap named Jura Grando Alovich, 
um, born in 1579 um, and originally died in 1656. Now, it's believed that around 16 years after his death, he rose from the grave to terrorise his local village. Right. Um, he was referred to as a Strigoi, as we okay, know. Yeah. He's, you know, um, Eastern European or you know, sort of Ukrainian, f- f- you know, for That's right, vampire yeah. or vampire. Um, and he was eventually beheaded, so died a second time in 1672. Um, now, the, why they thought he was a vampire, I couldn't really find so it's not like there was a you know a load of bodies with bite marks or mm. victims drained of blood or anything like that the only kind of thing that i could see was that it was basically believed that he would knock on the door of residents in his village and then someone from that house household would die within a, n- a number of days of him you know turning up but then there yeah. was no there was nothing as to how they died or you know or if anyone if actually saw him going knocking on doors. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> but this guy actually existed, and this is a legend that sort of came from, you know, came from from his death. Um, wow. But yeah, it, it sort of it came up sort of randomly in my searches, but it didn't come up before, which I thought was quite interesting. Which is why I didn't sure. you sort of mention it. But I mean, yeah, I thought I'd mention just because they mentioned you know sort of you know the Strigoi, um, and because of the sort of the time period, it does mm. predate what I'd found previously. Um, but yeah, there wasn't anything overly compelling as to why they actually thought he was a vampire. They just called him one. <laughs> so it's probably just a bit of a, a toothy sod who yeah. lived in the village and yeah, people yeah. didn't like him. They thought, oh yeah, he's a, he's a vampire. Isn't he? A bit long in the tooth. Yeah, here we go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not quite an innuendo, but it'll do. <laughs> yeah, close enough. Um, uh, so yeah, so I thought I'd um, yeah mention that. And obviously if there's anyone who knows a little bit more about him or this story and actually has been able to find why they thought he was a, a Strigoi, then um, yeah, please let us know. Yeah, get in touch with liner Because I couldn't find anything. Um, but yeah, if anyone does know, then um, yeah, please let us know and I'll, you know, we'll happily share it right. um, to the masses. Tell you what, text me that, that name after we finished yeah. and I've got my big book of vampire encyclopedia thing. I'll see if it's it in should there. be in there. Yeah. I'll see if it's in yeah, there. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll send you it. Yeah, definitely. Um, now, I didn't. Then this, this next one, when we spoke about it, mm. it was like, oh yeah, that's obvious. But at the time, it didn't ring any bells. Um, but basically, in, in Balkan f- um, folklore, mm. uh, which is like Bulgaria and parts of Turkey, that's sort of that part yeah, of Europe, yeah, yeah. Um, there is such a thing known as a dampier, dampier. Yeah. Yeah, damp- um, uh, yeah, dampier. Which are creatures that are the result of a union between a male vampire and a female human. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, a, a hybrid, um, like Blade, yeah. as we, you know, discussed, which when you said it, it was like, oh, yeah, a hybrid, like yeah. Daywalker. Yeah. Daywalker. <laughs> um, but, yeah, when I, I read this last night, it, it, I didn't make the, you know, the sort of the connection. But basically the name comes from the Albanian word, Dam or dam meaning tooth, and per meaning drink. Oh. So that's sort of tooth drinker. Um, oh, so well, that makes sense. Yeah, that's what. Yeah, so yeah, I thought that was quite um, interesting. Now I'll end on uh, another um, quick little sort of tidbit that I found, which uh, I think will kind of link quite nicely into what you're then gonna oh, okay, sort yeah, of go cool. on to. So this will be a nice sort of tenuous link yeah. <laughs> of sorts. Um, <laughs> But uh, in 2017, uh, in San Francisco, um, a startup company was offering um, clinical trials to old rich people, basically like, like the elite. Oh, okay. Um, and basically for £6,000, or I think it was about $8,200, mm. um, a teenager would um, donate blood, which would then be given to the recipient by way of a transfusion. Um, and it was done as a way to help rejuvenate the elderly as they believed that young blood had those sort of properties. Mm. Um, now, the typical age of a recipient was around 60, um, and the donor was you know, sort of a teenager, so yeah. you know, around sort of 17, 18, or whatever the legal age is, I guess, to 
sign up to a clinical trial. In San Francisco, it's probably a lot... Probably 14 or yeah, something. Yeah, probably a lot, lot younger than 18. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, being a blue city and all that. But yeah, and that's what I thought was, in, well, yeah, and that's what I thought was mm. interesting because they, they were happy to confirm the ages of the recipients but not the donors. <laughs> that makes plenty of sense. Which, yeah, but they did yeah. have quite a, you know, make a point of mentioning, you know, sort of young blood or teenage blood or whatever. So, yeah, I, I imagine it was probably younger than teenagers, you know, as well, especially because they're paying a... Cool. You know, a premium for it. Um, yeah, I bet Hillary was chomping well. at the bit, weren't she? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not saying anything. Could yeah, be she, any Hillary. Yeah, she funds it. I think she funds it, actually. So. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. Hillary, Hillary um, Ford, isn't it? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, the, yeah, one, that's yeah. the one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, now, tests were encouraging, um, you know, from, you know, and their findings. Um, but, and whilst they didn't believe it provided immortality, uh, they did believe that it worked towards basically restoring youth. And yeah, and and rejuvenation, um, and uh, yeah, and I think that's where a lot of the kind of, or not a lot of, but certainly part of the love of you know vampires and you know mm. the legend sort of comes from is this kind of restored youth or you know always staying young and beautiful and yeah. having all these you know um, you know like strength and speed and immortality. Oh, it's an incredibly and, attractive idea. And the kind of the romance and, and yeah. stuff behind it. So I think that's what. Kind of, certainly the youth element, I think, is what kind of lends itself really to why everyone sort of falls in love with mm. the idea of, you know, sort of vampires and why there's so much fucking romance novels <laughs> yeah. and fan fiction out there. Of, uh, I mean, because finding this was hard because you got to literally like find a needle in a, in a haystack of fan fiction and, you know, Vamp I mean, porn. if people think Twilight <laughs> yeah. was bad, Christ almighty. Yeah. Know, right. Just go online and find and search for like vamp porn or something. Oh my god. Jesus. Um so yeah, so they they clear just, your um, history. And then yeah, <laughs> yeah. Clear your cash uh, history. Yeah. Um so yeah, so that was uh yeah, a couple of little bits of um yeah, sort of nuggets of information that I'd either forgot to mention or have found since that I thought was a okay. uh, good sort of it sort of tacked on to the previous um mm. episode to kind of fill in a few gaps that, that I'd left. Um but uh, yeah, and that last one I thought specifically was quite good. Absolutely. Because yeah. it kind of feeds into what you're about to go into in the Dr. Does. Kaplan uh, book. Yeah, it certainly does. It goes into the idea of um, donors and, yeah. and, and, and the such and um, yeah. the the exchanges that they have. Yeah. Um, and uh, Elizabeth, the 400 plus year old vampire, mm. might actually be able to shed a little bit of light on some of the legends right, and okay. some of the biology. Wasn't Lizzie uh, Windsor, was it? It's not. <laughs> <laughs> no, we all know she's a lizard. <laughs> lizard, sorry, right? Okay, yeah. I get confused. Lizzie stands for lizard. Lizard, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we love her. Very good. Oh, we yeah, do. We do. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so the, this book, yeah, um, vampires are by Stephen Kaplan. Um, like I said, it, it, it's it was very very hard to come by. Mm. Very hard to come by, and I wasn't going to yeah. be spending like four or five hundred pound just to get a hardback copy. No, it's a good book, but it's not that good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Quite yeah, frankly, yeah. It's, it, <clears throat> but but give you a quick rundown as to the the history of it all. Um, in 1971, um, Stephen Kaplan was um, doing a graduate course in legal and political anthropology at State University in in Long Island. Okay, um, and he made some interesting observations. Um, basically, he was studying um, customs and rituals of primitive cultures, right, and what he found was that some of these customs and rituals showed striking similarities to vampire myths and legends. Right. And he's also a professional sociologist as well. So he was interested in the habits and rituals of particular groups and cultures of, of, of people. Right. As well as the effect that these may have on society in general. Right. So, okay. You know, society's yep. yeah. um, images or, yeah. or, or thoughts on these sort of practices and, and the such. Mm. So when he observe, observed that these two areas overlapped, he began to suspect that there might actually indeed be a basis of truth in the existence of vampires. Maybe not necessarily the supernatural creature, mm. but certainly the psychological aspect of people believing themselves to be vampires. Right. So in 1971, he um, and a couple of his colleagues decided to open up the Vampire Research Centre okay. in uh, New York State. Nice. Um, and the number one struggle that they had to begin with was actually getting their phone number in the directory. 
right? Because they had to convince the telephone company that no, 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 this is a legitimate research centre. We're yeah. it, it, it ain't just a laugh. Honestly, we are actually researching vampires, and they had to go. There was a lot of back and forth just to get their just number to get in, that right in the directory. Okay. But as soon as they do, mm. prank calls flooded in. <laughs> You can imagine. You got it. love for society, haven't you? You know, like the the yeah. the, the Dracula imitations and the if I yeah. was dark or blood, ah, 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 ah. and all of this, <laughs> yeah. blah, 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 and all of this. <laughs> yeah. Or um, I am a vampire and an artist. I'm good at drawing blood. And all this <laughs> God, stuff. yeah, oh, they're great. They're yeah. great. You got love. I've got, it. I've got another one. Go on. I'm a vampire and I like to fish. I can find a good bloodstream. <laughs> oh wow wow yeah so it's like a corny vampire pickup this, line it would have been it? this dopey twat making phone calls to them <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly yeah but yeah so um many many prank phone calls and it wasn't until um a quiet evening in september 1971 um and Stephen was alone answering the phones and he'd received three prank phone calls on the trot yeah <laughs> um, <laughs> and then he got one more um, a man called himself William um, and William said I'm a vampire and I'd like to know if you can introduce me to other vampires so initially he thought that it was a prank call and they had a little bit of back and forth and then he realised that actually William's serious about this Yeah. and oddly enough he thought that it was a, a dating service for vampires <laughs> right okay <laughs> like right can you hook yeah. me up that that sort of thing like yeah. you know i want to build a profile so yeah. um he runs with it Stephen runs runs with that he's like right. yeah yeah you know well you know we can, i can build a profile for you just need some information it'd be good if you know if we could actually meet up and i can have an interview with you that way i can build a really good um profile for you to match you up with other, other vampires mm. like steve uh, williams like yeah yeah all right then okay Happy to do that. So they arranged to meet at William's house the next night. And Steve, he's off he goes. And um, it's only, he's about halfway there and he dawns on him. I'm going to meet a bloody vampire. <laughs> or at least someone that thinks they're Whether a vampire. Whether it's nonsense or not, you're still going on your own yeah, to meet it, someone who believes that they're a vampire. Yeah, someone who, who says that they drink blood. And they probably need to feed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And he's like, oh, like, what the hell am I doing? And this is like yeah. his first. This is like the first one that's come through that he like he would consider to be genuine lead. A genuine yeah. lead. That's not a prank or a hoax or anything like this, yeah. as far as he can tell. Yeah, yeah. So he he actually gets gets to um, the address, yeah. and um, it's not what he was expecting. He in the back of his mind, he was expecting like some sort of medieval castle. Big Cloud. little Nate wooden door and... Thunder yeah. and lightning going off in the background and bats you, going... You rain. Yeah, yeah bats <laughs> flying around. <laughs> sort of, no, it's nothing like that. Headstones just, in the front yard and... Yeah, <laughs> yeah gargoyles. <laughs> Expecting them to march up to the Adams family house. Yeah, see, like yeah, yeah. Um, but no, it, it was just um, it's just a regular colonial style home with uh, a low porch, um, a yellow light at the front, white peeling paint, just a regular... Yeah. American Midwestern sort of house, yeah, yeah. I guess. Um, and uh, William was standing there in the doorway underneath the yellow porch light, and he looked like an ordinary person, um, about six foot tall, thin, maybe about thirty five years old, uh, brown hair, brown eyes, and he was wearing like comfortable slacks and knitted shirt um, and a light sweater, uh, but his teeth were perfect, right? Like, perfectly white, even. No sign of fangs, <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> no. <laughs> I know, right? Um, uh, William says, as, as Stephen's walking, Stephen Kaplan, Stephen nods and they shake hands. And he noted that William's hands were incredibly warm, very I smooth. It was a clammy, smooth handshake. Well, the thing is, is <laughs> Stephen says his own hands were really clammy and cold because oh, he, right. he's meeting he's a nervous. fucking, <laughs> yeah. a fucking yeah. vampire. You know, <laughs> just like, don't eat me. Oh, just don't hurt <laughs> me, please. <laughs> So, yeah, come on in. Uh, we can talk in the living room, he goes. So he leads him to, to the living room. And uh, the living room was dominated by an unusually large coffee table, about six feet long, and around it was um, sort of like... About, comfort- about six feet, shaped like a coffin, <laughs> with <laughs> Stephen Kaplan written on it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. You've had the Stephen Kaplan here before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, so... Yeah, um, yeah it, it, again, it just... Everything just looked normal, yeah. you know. There was like some nice, comfortable chairs and a sofa, and and oh, we called it a couch. There's a, a soft brown rug on the floor, yeah. um, and the only light was coming from um, a lamp 
on a coffee table in the corner. Right. It's a little bit dark and, you know, set in the mood. <laughs> but there was a little bit of a surprise for him because initially he didn't spot her, but there was a, a woman sitting on the couch and he describes her as strikingly sensuous. And she was wearing a sheer flowing dress. She smiled pleasantly at him and her teeth were even nicer than William's. Oh, right. So that might have that, some sort of dentist cult going I was on. I was say, yeah, there must be, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? well, they're quite proud of their teeth, aren't they, Americans, to the point where they just assume that all Brits have got horrible, jagged, like, scummy teeth, yeah. haven't they? Yeah. yeah, well, speak for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no mine, mine, mine are nice and, nice and straight, <laughs> mine, mine so right. I'm happy yeah. with that. Yeah. Not all stereotypes are true, guys. No, definitely not. not. stereotypes. <laughs> but... Um, he, uh, William introduces her as uh, Lorena and uh, he says that by day he's an engineer at the famous university nearby um, but by night he and Lorena are involved in vampirism. Right. Um, Lorena as well seemed quite happy to discuss their habits and uh, she she seemed to relish in the words as she told um, Stephen about the, they practice bloodletting and drinking human blood. Right. Um, and she even added that William enjoyed sleeping in a coffin. Let's do it. Okay. Hang on. <laughs> Hang about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Coffin. Easy. Yeah, you, you're right. Okay. And he goes, yeah, sure. It's, it's in the bedroom. So he goes, it's, it's just this way. So as William is leading Stephen to the right, bedroom. I'm falling for that one. <laughs> yeah. lit, Lorena's, Lorena's uh, you know, watching the six. She's she's right. coming up behind Stephen. All right. Um, he's, you know, his palms are getting even more sweaty. Yeah, and, as uh, they He's would. getting a little bit more nervous. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and this wasn't no usual bedroom. No usual bedroom. It right. was like something out of Fifty Shades of Grey. But there was there was a coffin there. There's a coffin in the middle of the room, um, about three foot off the ground, he says. Um, a very ornate. Um, it, it, it looked like an expensive coffin. like. Yeah. It, it was all um, silk lined and everything, yeah. like sort yeah. of thing you'd expect. You'd expect, yeah, yeah. That sort of thing. <laughs> but lining the walls were whips, chains, straps, handcuffs, all various different paraphernalia, wow. paddles and, <laughs> and all of that. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> Blimey. Thank, thank you, sir. May I have another? <laughs> yeah. um, and... <laughs> As as he's he's there taking in all the sights, Lorena is behind him and she kind of shuffles past him. Right. And uh she starts gesturing towards the paraphernalia. And she says to him that one of her favourite things to do um is to don some leather gloves and beat William until he's bloody, and then she licks the blood. Jesus. Right. Okay. And she says, I find this very arousing sexually. And she's gesturing to all of the all of the paraphernalia about yeah. and looking Stephen up and down and like giving him the old cheeky <laughs> the old uh, proposition the old like, cheeky wink and all yeah. of that sort of stuff and um Stephen's like mm, oh I know what's nope. happening here he's like you know, <laughs> yeah. he goes, it makes me laugh here he goes she smiled provocative at me I shook my head politely no she was awfully beautiful standing un- there under those whips and handcuffs, but no. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> That's a solid no. That's a solid <laughs> no. But part of me thinks like, this this seems to happen as well through yeah. other bits in the book. Right. He gets and, propositioned. Yeah. Right. And, and like each time it happens, I think he's gonna go, for science! And he's gonna <laughs> dive in head first. And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's just gonna go, right, that's it. You know, I'm part of my research. It really is. <laughs> Oh, he thinks he's a he's a better man than me. Put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so th- th- he's he's now like, oh no, thanks, and he starts edging his way out of the bedroom and <laughs> wanting to get back to the living room where it looks a bit more normal and a bit more comfortable, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, less painful. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Um, so he goes, well, where do you get your blood from? Um, and William says, well, we have two types of donors. Um, there are the willing donors and pause for dramatic effect and unwilling ones. The willing donors exchange sexual favours with us and in return we get their blood. Um, and he goes on win, to explain. Win. Yeah, win-win, <laughs> isn't it? 
And he goes on to explain that they've, got a, they've formed a group of about four or five people that regularly visit and donate blood for sexual favours. Right. So you go around there, you get spanked or get spanked or get wanked and <laughs> you give a little bit of blood and <laughs> on your way off your pop. Yeah, you know, yeah. Maybe even a little bit of a bit, maybe a little biscuit or <laughs> something like that. For being a good boy. Yeah, being a good boy, you know, it's, it's, you're driving, so here's a biscuit. <laughs> Of anyone that's given blood before, of course. Um, Lorena, not actually, like that, I haven't. No, not quite. No. It'd be a whole different. I think experience. I'd be more up for it if it was. <laughs> but I don't think that'd be under the NHS somehow. <laughs> Certainly wouldn't be doing that in the church, or would you? <laughs> there behave. we go. Behave. So, uh, Lorena, later on, um, as they're you know, she they're talking about the the regular visitors. Yeah. Um, Lorena says that um, two of them were uh, lady wrestlers who would happily punch each other until they were covered in blood to the sensual delight of others. All right, yeah. yeah. To, uh, to each their own, I think, uh, on that absolutely. one. <laughs> so the, the interview continues and uh, Stephen, he asks them, well, how much blood do you drink at one time? Yeah. And William answers, he says, well, it depends on the situation, maybe six or eight ounces, I guess, about a, hell. A, a juice glass full in each sitting. I mean, that's a lot. It is. That's but a then, lot. But then Lorena goes, or as much as we can get, baby. Oh, God. <laughs> Do you want to find out? Yeah, exactly. No. Like the whole time she's there, it's pouring at him. It's just like, like, let me drink your blood, yeah. fiend. Let me get you. <laughs> Say my name. <laughs> 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 and uh, then it, 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 it doesn't just end there. They then bring out a photo album which showed the two of them drinking blood and licking wounds from the donors, um, many of whom were chained to the wall in the bedroom or lying on the floor. One of them was lying strapped to the coffee table in the middle of the living room, which is why the coffee table was so big. Ah, that would explain <laughs> it. So he goes, Stephen's looking at these pictures and he's, well, are these the unwilling donors? And uh, William says, oh, no, no, no. Um, most of these people go along with what we want them to do. Um, we occasionally even pay them to act out our fantasies with us. So it's not just... They, they pretend to be unwilling as opposed to actually being Absolutely. Unwilling. Like a bit of role play. Because that's a thing. felon. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. If it's unwilling... <laughs> that's assault. <laughs> on, on, on a few different levels. <laughs> yeah. You, you know, there's a couple of tears involved in there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so as they're, you know, they're going through the... Uh, the photo album, Lorena comes out of the kitchen with a tray with some liquid in a pitcher and a couple of glasses. Yeah. And she asks him, would you like a drink? <laughs> nah. I'm like, no, I'm not thirsty. No, thank, thank you. you. No, thank you. No, thank you. I don't want to be one of the unwilling ones. You know, like, yeah. no, no, no. So he kindly uh, declines. Yeah. Um, and uh, he starts, you know, saying, thank you very much for your time. Uh, he, yeah. He says, Must be going. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he told William and Lorena that they had a very interesting and exciting life, and he thanked them for inviting them in for the interview. Mm. And uh, he said, as I, as I promised on the phone, I'll get back to you as soon as I make contact with other vampires. You know, mm. I've got my profile of you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, very much appreciate it. Uh, bye bye. <laughs> bye bye now. And then he got the hell out of there. <laughs> yeah. Like, fucking going, mate. And yeah. um, so by the time he got back to. <laughs> But by the time he got back to um, the centre, he realised that from a scientific point of view, from a research point of view, he mm. had no real way of actually categorising them because they hadn't even really figured out the sort of criteria as to, as to measure William and Lorena. Mm. Like, were they real vampires or were they just... just was there just a psychological aspect like to it? or something, yeah. Exactly. Well, you know, was it just that? Um, so him and his team decided to sit down and they were going to go through what categories would describe a vampire. Right. And they realised that you couldn't really um, ascertain if someone was a vampire just based on their look because clearly these two people who considered themselves to be vampires looked just normal. Just right. normal yeah. people. So like you could pass them in the street and not know any different. Exactly. Sort of thing. Yeah. So instantly straight off of, off of this interview, he's realised that fangs is not necessarily a factor. So you can't go off of visuals. No. So it has to be what do vampires do? 
Um, so then they, they actually came up with these three um, sets of criteria in which it would allow people, allow them to categorise the various different cases. The type of vampire the or the type of person or whatever it may be. Exactly, yeah. Okay. yeah. So we've got the person must have a need to drink human blood and actually drink it. Mm. Um he, she, yeah, that's an interesting one. That 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 last bit. Yeah, and, and actually, actually drink it. Actually yeah, drink that's, it. Yeah, he or she must believe this ritual will prolong his or her life, perhaps eternally. Yeah. Um, the person may find sexual satisfaction from this ritual. So if you're right. ticking all the boxes, mm. then it's quite likely you're a real vampire. Yeah, sort of thing. So you, yeah, as but much as you believe. Yeah. 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 I mean, he doesn't go into huge amounts of detail as to his conclusions i think he may do later on in the book in the chapters that i don't actually have yeah yeah um but from what i've got here he doesn't really go into um his uh conclusions on each of the cases right so it's quite likely that that's what he does later on in the book <coughs> that yeah. i haven't got um but he decided that he was going to do a follow-up call because now that they've categorize them he'd mm. like to actually do a proper interview with them where he's actually taking yeah. notes and he's not overwhelmed um and maybe bring a friend you know, <laughs> or a the, gun at the very least <laughs> so he, he dials william's number but it gets no answer it just keeps ringing through um and he does this for a whole week and then by the end of the week the number's actually disconnected oh right so it's no longer going through it's just straight up number doesn't exist oh billy boy's not paying his uh, phone line <laughs> Apparently so. But then they decide three of them, this time three, not just the one, right. three of them from the centre go to visit William's address um, right. and no one's there, as in the place is cleared out. There's nothing left in there. The place is completely empty. Right. Um, they even call uh, the university where William said that he was employed Yeah. and they have no record of him. So either, either he didn't actually work there or William isn't his name. Yeah, or William something. He doesn't give the the, yeah. the surname. The surname, yeah. But yeah, there's no, there's no one there that works at that like with that that name. Yeah. at the university. Sure. Um, which makes sense really because these people, if they are genuine, mm. they're very secretive because of the outside culture, the outside society seeing them for what they are, and basically driving them out with torches and pick and yeah. pitchforks and everything yeah, you know yeah. like getting, going down that sort of route so they are very afraid of being exposed yeah but it's the same reason why the, uh, some of the stories that we've been um given yeah by listeners and stuff have they've been asked to be anonymous because oh, of the ramifications of people finding out and you know the, the mockery or the mm. you know changing of opinion of you i guess if people start learning that you're believing in this that and the other so exactly yeah, do get it yeah absolutely yeah. that's why a lot of people when they start getting into alternative cultures and such, yeah, exactly. You yeah. know, they they are very quiet about it. They're very <clears throat> guarded, um, yeah. Unless there's an outward manifestation in the way that you appear, yeah. Then people tend to be very secretive about it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but this was the first in quite a few phone calls that they got that were um, seemingly genuine. Mm. You know, they weren't actual prank calls or hoaxes for what they could gather. Yeah. Um, and uh, things actually started getting a bit dangerous for the research team. Um, right. In February 1972, um, the the phone rang and Stephen picked it up. And a man with a deep voice was chanting some, what he calls mumbo jumbo. And <laughs> with uh, rhythmical beats in the background. And all that right, sort of okay. stuff or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then it says, Stephen Kaplan, you will die. Before midnight tonight, we have put a curse upon you. We are coming to get you. Be prepared. Expect to die. Do, 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 do. <laughs> so that shit him up. It was, Big time. Yeah, I think it would, wouldn't it? Yeah, absolutely. He spent the rest of the day with the windows and all the doors locked at the centre. Yeah. He was like, oh, fucking this. Oh, this. this is the first death, <laughs> death, threat, like, death threat that I've ever received just by looking into this. It's yeah, like, yeah. oh my God, this is getting... And he's it. only spoken to like one couple and already this is happening. So yeah, it's like, yeah, absolutely. But he's had a couple, they've had a couple of phone calls where they've tried to arrange something and yeah. it's fallen through. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they've only met one couple. Um, so like, in the ensuing months after that, they received many death threats 
And up until the point at which they published the book, they still were getting death threats. Wow. Um, this were Some of them were from members of blood cults. Uh, some were for, from certain religious groups who were convinced that they were working for Satan. You know, Of course, because everything's the, the devil. Compiling yeah. the demons. Um, yeah. And it was their duty to kill us in the name of God, is what he said. God, All right, okay. Yeah. yeah. You know, the Church of Eternal Light or something well, like that. You rubbish, know? yeah. Mm. Yeah, so... Um, they decided that, okay, we really do need to start putting in precautions now. Right. Um, this is going far beyond just collecting data. Right. We're actually getting involved in stuff now where darkness, being blood cults are calling you up, calling you, like giving you death threats and whatnot. You have to start putting precautions into place. Um, he, he says, like, it's simple ones, like, no one would go on an investigation alone. Yeah. You'd make sure that you had a, you made sure that you made a phone call in front of the people you were interviewing to say, like to the center to say they know my whereabouts and they know when to expect me back because they always made it really very apparent with any of the phone calls that any crimes would be um, reported to the authorities. So any unwilling donors yeah. or anything like that, any evidence of that would be instantly Repulsive. given to yeah. the authorities regardless of – it depends on whether the authorities actually act upon it because if you give them a bell and say, look, I've been doing interviews with um, – um, Vampires. Um, and Ding. I found it. Sorry, what? Sorry, what vamp <laughs> sorry vampires? Sorry. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah um, vampires. Um, go and have a look at this address. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah. Mm, yeah. All right, mate. On your bike. Um, but in spite of all the precautions that they had taken, um, he wasn't able to prevent a terrible event happening to his family. Right. Yeah. So in late October of the same year, uh, my family and I were enjoying a lazy Sunday afternoon at home and our dog, Nova, um, a beautiful young sable and white collie, was romping around in the background whilst the children, who usually play in the yard too, were occupied with some indoor games. And Nova found some cookies on the ground um, and being a normal dog, he ate one. Yeah. Um, and died almost instantly. Oh, shit. Yeah. Proper, on their like, own land? On their own land, in their backyard. Um, Shit. Yeah, serious, serious stuff. Um, they they found um, Nova lying on the on the ground dead, um, and they found some of these cookies, and they was like, oh, my God, it's, it's been poisoned. So they had them analysed, and they found lethal poison strychnine in it, and it is, it's lethal. Like that, you're dead. Wow. And it, that I mean, if the children had been out, that's the thing. Yeah, it was also done as cookies to attract the kids, not so the, much the dog. The dog, at the very least. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's absolutely shocking. Um, and later that night, he receives a phone call from a man who said that he was a, a Satanist. Um, he said, "Next time, we'll get you and your whole family." So <laughs> he quite rightly yeah, yeah. up sticks and moved his family elsewhere and just kept his location a complete secret. Yeah. Because the thing is, with, when you're doing an investigation and all that sort of stuff, you are you have to put your details out there. Or certainly you had to previously. Well, you need people to trust you, to confide in the information that you want to get out exactly. of them. So you need to disclose a certain amount. I mean, yeah. there, there seems to be a certain level of naivety from, <clears throat> from his part Yeah, in that this isn't just some normal study. Mm. You know, you're starting to attract... Um, you're starting to attract some really bad people. Yeah, some unwanted attention. Oh, absolutely. Um, and this is where, at the, at, for after this point here, he realised that with the, the constant death threats and the difficulty in following up the cases and the gradual shrinking of the staff because of these death threats. Of course, cool, yeah. Uh, death threats. So he, that it was all getting a bit too demanding and he, he was he was ready to give up. Like within about well, less than two years, maybe 18 months of, of opening up the centre, he was ready to throw in the towel. Mm. But then he realised, like, well, hang on a second. You only ever get this sort of reaction if there's something to be found. If you're starting to piss off people... You're doing the right thing. Exactly. Yeah. You know, you're being one of those pesky kids, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. And you're going to uncover something. Yeah. So he's, the, the tenacity in mm. him starts going, no, you know what? I'm gonna make I'm gonna make sure everything is safe for yeah. my team, my family, their families. Yeah. And we're gonna uncover it. We're gonna uncover something. Yeah. 
Um, so the reports then start trickling in from around the country and and then and, and also other parts of the world. And some actual vampire cases were emerging and they tried to develop some sort of pattern to them. So they were finding that there were so-called vampire deaths. Yeah. Uh, people victims of vampires mm. and such dotted all over the country. Um, but the... The, he, they managed to find themselves into like get themselves into another sticky situation um, in the early part of um, seventy three, right? And they got a call from um, Sarah, um, who was from New York State as well, which is where the uh, the center was situated, mm. and she called the center to say that she had um, a report of a blood drinking vampire demon that was inhabited inhabiting a barn that was near her. Um, and initially, Stephen thought, oh, this is a hoax, vampire demon, really, seriously? Mm. Like, But she seemed very, very convincing in what she was saying. So as, the, as he con- conducted the interview over the phone, he actually became more and more convinced that she was serious. Like, this isn't, right. a, this isn't a hoax. This yeah, isn't yeah. A, a, a she fake. truly believes what she's telling me. Absolutely. Thing, yeah. So she, it was the thing... What the, she she basically reveals that it was between her and her friends that had accidentally summoned this vampire demon when they were performing an occult ritual in this barn. Right. So he's like, right, okay. And he had already previously done research into occult rituals, at least certainly the ones that you would expect to see in the quote unquote mainstream part of occult mm. culture. Um, you know, the various different witch books and um, I can't think of what the name of the, the book is, but I'll, Save that for later. Yeah. Um, so they actually decide to to go to this location that Sarah had spoken about, and they meet her there. Um, and on arrival, they meet Sarah, who's short, overweight, um, and struggling to breathe, walk and talk. <laughs> like, oh, okay. So American, then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> boom, boom, boom. <laughs> oh, shots fired. <laughs> <laughs> shots fired. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, we're friends now. You know, that, that's it, that's it. They, friends. Yeah. They drove us out a couple of hundred years ago. We're friends. We're now. friends now. Yeah, we need to get over it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I yeah they, they, they they won that one. We'll yeah. give it to them. I jest. Yeah, it, it's got a lot of stereotypes. Haven't you? <laughs> Even when they're true, maybe when they're not true. You know? Yeah, I like the stereotypes. <laughs> but um, Sarah brought some friends with her. Um, there's Terry, um, who was tall, thin, messy, unwashed hair. And she was wearing a cape. <laughs> there was right. also Nick, who was also tall. Um, was <laughs> Nick. I know, oh, Nick, yeah. The tall, wiry man, um, dirty blonde hair. Um, and Stephen says he had an odd scent. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think I he's being just, polite I think there. they're just homeless, I think. Is I don't it? think they're... they're vampires living in a barn i think they're vagrants well, well, it's kind of like the, the sort of thing that when you get over here like when people get into the grunge and then they you know they, they <clears> at least when we were younger it was grunge and then going yeah. into like metal and then goth you might go into being goth you yeah. might start listening to cradle of filth yeah, or yeah. something like that and then got in the makeup and yeah all that stuff, like, yeah like drawing inverted pentagrams <laughs> on your forehead and, and that, that yeah. sort of stuff but yeah been there done that got the t-shirt yeah um and it seems like that's exactly what the, these that's three were going through. Yeah, they're just and undesirables, and this woman thinks they're bloody vampires. Yeah, so he's like, he's like oh, oh, fucking goth hell, kids I again. Into fucking again. emos. <laughs> so they're standing outside this barn, um, and Terry says, uh, I can feel it. It's in there. And Stick is like, you can feel it? And Terry goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Terry, Terry's psychic. She, she's psychic. She can tell when it's in there. He's like... All right, okay, then let's um let's go and have go. A, <laughs> yeah. let's go and have a look then you know because uh, on on top of things as well um Stephen Kaplan is a parapsychologist and, uh, okay um certainly by the various different reports and I knew I re- recognized his name and it was to do with the Amityville horror he investigated uh, okay. Amityville horror and said it's a straight up hoax like right, it, okay. and for the, the the people that are on the um skeptical side. He is their champion. Their leader, yeah. He's their champion. So right, he's okay, like, all right, fun. come on in, guys. Let's go in there. Let's go and have a look. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, Terry's going, well, it's up there. It's up there in the in the, the loft space, in, you know, just that mezzanine area mm. up there. It's hidden yeah, of up course there. It is. Up yeah. this ladder. Yeah, yeah. So, so he was like, well, okay, well, 
let's go and have a look then. And he's talking to his other two researchers. And let's go in, let's go and have a look, see what's going on. So now they're inside the barn and they're discussing the ritual and that they had enacted um, and why they believe that they had summoned a vampire demon. Um, and basically they're, they're, the researchers are still trying to profile them. They're just, right. you know, trying to get some information out of these guys just to like, right, okay, let's see how mm. we can profile this particular case. Yeah. Um, Sarah says that she forgot to get something from the car outside, so she goes outside. And then she comes <laughs> hurriedly waddling in, um, <laughs> saying like, quick, like, quick, 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 the, the owner's coming, quick, get into the loft space. Now, go, go. So he's like, well, why? 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 He's like, because we're trespassing and he doesn't mind us, but he hates strangers. He's like, well, you should have told us we were trespassing. We could have actually just gone and asked Gone ask him. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, like the, she's like, no, I told you. He hates strangers. Quickly, just, just, just get up the ladder. Just get up the ladder. Like this. And, oh, no. Yeah. The bloody thing's up there. <laughs> so the, the ladder leads to the loft space. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, uh, she's like, he knows us. We'll, 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 we'll tell him that we're just out here for a walk. But if he sees you guys, he'll, he'll, go, he'll go crazy. He'll go mad. So Steve was like, what the hell was... So as he starts looking over toward the, the ladder, he can see through um, the barn shutters, so on the window. Right. So well, the, the, the shutters, are it's mm. not quite yeah. closed, and he can see through, and he sees three men in dark robes walking toward the barn. <laughs> and he goes, run, go, just get out of it, go, like this. And they push and past. This is Stephen that shouted that. This is Stephen because right. he spotted him. He's like, oh, shit, we're in trouble cult, here. Cult shit, yeah. We're in trouble. So yeah, yeah. quick, get out. So they push past the vagrants <laughs> um, and they run to their car and they jump in. They just they just zoom straight back to the centre. Like, holy fucking shit. How close did we come there? Mm-hmm. Because if they did get up into that loft space, they could have just taken the ladder away. Chucked them up there and then, yeah. Done, them. done whatever, yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> whatever it was that yeah. they did. So... Again, on reflection of this, they needed to put in further security measures. Mm. Um, now like, he doesn't like don't meet at creepy barns at, at night. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, that, well, he doesn't say what time. Oh, it was okay, as well. right. He doesn't okay. say what time it was. I don't Fair know if enough. it was during right. the day. I'm guessing it was there was some sort of daylight because he could see the people in robes coming. But he doesn't say exactly what time. Um, now he he does he doesn't go into what those extra security measures are mm. because presumably at the point of this bar, this book being written and published the center's still open right um and i just didn't actually look actually i didn't think to, to think to look to see if the center's actually still going still open like now yeah yeah it'd be very interesting if it is yeah yeah i've got some calls to make yeah <laughs> that's to say we've got an email to send <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um so I'll just be, yeah, 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 we've heard that one before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but a few weeks later, Sarah actually makes another call to the centre and saying that she was really sorry for what had happened. Um, but she was now actually asking Stephen for help. Right. And he's like, what the hell should I, sh- what the hell should I help you? Yeah. You know, like. You tricked us. You tricked <laughs> yeah. us. You were going to trap us and God knows what was going to happen. Yeah. You know, we probably could have been killed. Mm. You know, like, why should I help you? And she's like, yeah, that's right. Um, you were supposed to be used for a blood ritual um, and the demons were supposed to inhabit your bodies. Demons? And then she later on explains that it wasn't just one vampire demon, there's ten. They had summoned <laughs> ten vampire demons. Right. And she goes on to explain that she had sort of fallen in with a group of Satanists. Mm. Um, or at least people that called themselves Satanists. And um, the way that that happened was that her kids were attending like the local Boy Scouts group. Yeah. And <laughs> and the leader, and the leaders later confided in her that they were Satanists. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So watch um, the the Scout leaders out there. Yeah. Keep an eye on your, your Boy Scout leaders. Yeah. yeah. Look for uh, you know telling markings and. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Bangs. Bangs or... Uh, Capes. <laughs> yeah, robes and such. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just um, keep an eye out for yeah. it. Because basically they'd got in, con- in conversation about um, occult interests and everything. So Sarah was... She considered herself um, a keen occultist. Um, so she explains that as a prospect to the new group, mm. it was her job to acquire 10 people for the demons to inhabit. Right. So... Not only that, but it was she was 
also supposed to make the group aware of any pregnancies or births in the local area because the group wanted to use an unblemished soul for another ritual. And a newborn is the cleanest soul you can get, apparently. Yeah, well, that's why there's a fascination, maybe not so much with babies, or no, or no, that now you've obviously mentioned that, but obviously babies and, and virgins yeah. are kind of like the um, top of the food chain soul. sort of thing because, yeah, they, they would presumably carry the purest blood. Well, absolutely. Well, yeah. the reason now why she's asking for help is because she failed at both of those tasks in recent weeks. They're after her. They're after her and her kids. So, Should have thought about that, and I'm nuts. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you don't. If you've got kids, you don't join a, some sort of satanic cult. What's wrong with you? <laughs> yeah. like, Dear old lord. Some people, mate. I know. Pe- just people. Fucking people. Maybe man. we. Sh- maybe we really <laughs> should just remove all the safety stickers and just let them have at it. Just let natural selection uh, do its thing. You would have thought. <laughs> so they do actually. They, they, it it kind of pulls at his heartstrings because kids are involved. Right. So they actually arranged to meet at her house. Um. Along with the new protocols, that's definitely protocols. you definitely pick a neutral location. You would have that, thought that Kaplan picks. Well, this is just I it. wouldn't be going to because you don't know what she's done to her house, whether she's trapped it or exactly. got people stalking it. And well, they actually turn up two hours early to, they, to catch her off on the door. But they, they turn up earlier and they scout the place out and mm. they just make sure no one can't, no one's coming and going. Um, and uh, yeah, so they actually turn up two hours early to that's clever the interview. Mm. Um, just to make sure they catch her unawares. Yeah. And her house is covered in occult symbology. Like there's books, posters, tapestries, VHS tapes. Right. Occult yeah. everywhere. Um, Pentagrams painted on the walls. and <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, that sort of shit. Yeah. Um, and her parents um, were there too. So her parents were there and they'd actually moved in to help protect the kids. Right. So she at least told them about her silly activities um, and said, yeah, my children are now in danger. Yeah. Um, and she's like, you know, I need your help. What can you help me mm-hmm. with this? And uh, they get through it all, and they start talk, like, start talking about all the events leading up to it. Yeah. And he, Kaplan, like Stephen Kaplan, he says, well, there's not much we can do. In all honesty, as you say, you've never actually witnessed any crimes that the group have done. Mm-hmm. Like you've never w- witnessed any um, unwilling participants in any yeah, of the no like sort of crime as such. Yeah. Exactly. Um, the only thing that I can suggest is that you move out of here and if they pursue you, then what you need to do is you need to tell them that we, the Vampire Research Centre, know everything about them and we'll expose them. Obviously, that's a huge bluff. Yeah. But well, and a potentially dangerous one because it's then putting them on the radar for harm absolutely. by threatening to expose them. Yeah, I mean, they've got these various different security measures in place where the – a lot of the new members to the centre are anonymous right. as well. So their names aren't published anywhere. Yeah. Um, I believe they've got, they must, he doesn't go into any details about it because obviously, like I explained, the book came out when the centre was at least yeah. still open and um, he was still about. Yeah, yeah. So I would assume that there were various different comings and goings protocols that they had. Um, but if you think about it, the huge bluff actually worked because the sensitive nature of these various different groups, they don't want to be exposed. So, Yeah, I guess that is the opposite of what they're trying to, yeah. Exactly. So without unmasking them, we know all about you. Yeah, yeah. Leave her alone or we'll expose you. We might not be to the authorities, but we'll let everyone know yeah. in the local area who you are and what you're up to. Um, and, yeah, apparently the, it did actually work. And uh, she calls back several months later to just, to just say, yeah, I've, I've moved out, I've moved on, I've, I've left all of that behind me, <laughs> all the occult bollocks yeah. and everything behind me. And, um, yeah, everyone's safe. The kids are safe. I'm safe. And I haven't heard cool. anything from them. That's good. But Until. <laughs> until <laughs> later. <laughs> yeah. But that seemed to be a, 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 the, the running theme as mm. to what they were actually getting themselves into right. when they were asking these questions and basically putting themselves out there on on – the dark world radar yeah, sort yeah. of thing. Um, and the next one that, that, that came up was in, um, it wasn't far, wasn't long after this, again, early 73. Right. About 2 a.m., he gets a call from someone called Ramona. Now, Ramona says that I found your number in my phone book. Um, I need someone to talk to. 
I would think I'm, you know, people would think that I'm crazy, but I know that I'm not. I just need to drink human blood. Could I possibly come over and talk to you? So he continued with the, with the At interview. this point, you'd be like, for fuck's sake. fuck's sake, another one. <laughs> so this is, you know, this, these are the, the worms on hooks that he's dangling. So you so signed up You signed up for it. Signed so, up yeah. for it, mate. You've yeah. made your bed. you got exactly, a line yeah. in it. Um, so he continues to interview her on the phone for another half hour. Um, and it, it, to him, it seems like she was very sincere. Um, so they made the appointment and she was going to come into the office the next day. Day, not night. Um, <laughs> yeah. And the first thing that he noticed was just how young she looked. And on the phone, she said that she was um, about 30 years old, but she looked no more than 18. So maybe, he says, yeah. maybe drinking blood really does make a person yeah. look younger. It right, does actually okay. rejuvenate. Yeah. And he says that Ra- Ramona was fascinating, one of the most feminine, sensual women I'd ever seen, an exotic-looking blonde, very heavily made up, with a voice that exuded as much sexuality as her body did. She talked about her vampire lust, which she had said had been for the last 10 years. Right. Um, and she'd been drinking blood for, the, for that time, for all of that time, and said she had tamed the blood by trading for sexual favours, a common theme that keeps yeah. coming up for him as well, is that people will trade sexual favours for blood drinking. Right. Um. So he asks her, you know, how do you extract the blood? Do you bite your donors? She says, oh, no, 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 that's much too painful. At that point, she pulls out a little clutch purse. Um, and she opens it, and she's got two little things in there. One is a 5cc hypodermic syringe, and the other is a fresh razor blade. And she goes, I'm very good at extracting blood painlessly. She says, <laughs> she says quite proudly. And I always take it from a part of the body that doesn't show. So he goes, well, doesn't that make your donor lose his um, concentration? And uh, she smiles and says, not at all. We both enjoy it. At the right time, I just place the needle into an artery. Then I squirt the blood into my mouth and I'll lick any blood that's left on the wound. Wow. It's a wonderful feeling. It really turns me on. For fuck's sake. <laughs> He's like, uh, 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 He's out of time. Uh, I need to go. For science. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> for the research. Yeah, for the research. <laughs> for he king and like, country. <laughs> <laughs> Lay back and think of England. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, he goes, whoa, you know, what, what do you do with a razor blade? And uh, yeah. so, well, sometimes if I want to prolong, <laughs> prolong the pleasure... I'll use that to make little slashes on his body. The best place is the chest. Buttocks are too fleshy. They don't bleed as freely. So he told her, that, like, okay, all right, it looks like you're, in all honesty, it kind of looks like you're putting on a bit of an act. It all sounds a bit incredible. And she gets quite indignant about it. She goes, I'm not making this up. I'll show you. <laughs> <laughs> no, she, no, it's fine. She inched closer, leaning into his face, you know, low cut top as well, you know. Right pushing it forward and all of this sort of stuff. She goes, let's do it together. You know, that's really why I came here. I live in Oregon and I heard about your reputation. I came all the way to New York to meet you. I admire your power. Come, let me show you real pleasure, she purrs. And like, his red flags are going off. Yeah. yeah well, red yeah. flags because previously she had said that she was local. And now she's saying that she's all the way that she's come all the way from Oregon. Yeah, so she's let that slip. Yeah, yeah. Um, so he's like, okay, straight up, this doesn't sound good. Um, yeah. But again, he <laughs> still says here, st- still in his mind, going yeah. for science. <laughs> <laughs> she's very attractive, apparently, very very attractive. Right. Um, <laughs> what happens after that? Hang on. Oh, pages oh. stuck together. There oh. we go. Yeah, I've got a bit excited. <laughs> <laughs> Where were we, were? <laughs> where, where we were. <laughs> so he, he politely declines, um, but right. she's still insulted by his rejection. Um, just, don't you want to experience blood oozing from your body? He's like, uh, no. No, no, funny no, enough. no, I don't. No. I'm, I'm I'm, keep it in my veins. Yeah, thank I'm, you. I'm quite happy where it is. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, and he, he says, like, well, you know, is there any way that maybe you can, if, if, you, if this is what you want, if this is what you really want to do, you yeah. really want to show me what it is that you do. Yeah. Do you reckon maybe you could show me 
but with someone else. Yeah. Like when you're donors you know, or yeah, maybe yeah, yeah. you know for research purposes, I could watch you do what you do. <laughs> there are services for that. <laughs> so she's like, oh, you know, I'd very much enjoy having you there. Um, and you'll see what pleasures blood drinking gives me. So he's like, right, okay, yeah, okay, we'll do this. And uh, they arranged for that night that they were going to go to a motel um, and Kaplan was going to meet the meet her and one other. Whoever, there. yeah. Um, he also said that, you know, they had she, – she, she only wanted him there. She said, don't bring anyone else. I just want you there. Yeah. And he's like, well, we have certain protocols in place. He said, well, they can be outside, but I only want you inside. But you do it. <laughs> <laughs> but you do it. And uh, so he's like, okay, okay, well, they'll just, they'll stay in the car then. Um, but I said to them, if I'm not out within half hour, then call the police. She's like, that's fine, that's fine. Mm. So they go, he goes to the motel and when he gets there, there's an average looking man around 40 years old. Just again, just some random, he just looks yeah. like anyone out of the, no one out of the ordinary. Um, and, uh, you know, she does the introductions and everything else like that. And then within minutes, they acted like Stephen wasn't there. Right. Within a few minutes, they had gone into the bedroom and Stephen sat in the doorway observing. So they start, you know, kissing, caressing, doing, hopping on the good foot, doing the bad thing and all of that sort of stuff. And then he notices something shiny in Ramona's hand. And it's the razor blade. And she starts cutting it across his chest. And the guy doesn't flinch. Whatever it is that she's doing, he's not feeling that. Um, and she makes, yeah, like I said, she makes qu- three, like a couple of quick slashes across his chest and hungrily began licking the blood off of his chest and thoroughly enjoying herself while she's doing it. She did this for about five minutes and then they were done. Right. And they, right. they remain in the bed, resting, and totally ignoring Stephen. Completely ignoring him. Ramona lay there with her eyes open, staring dreamily off into the middle distance, um, and looking totally satisfied and content. Her partner looked exhausted and tired. Like, drained, almost. <laughs> um, and feeling a little bit awkward, he's like, he stood up to leave and was like, thank you for um, allowing me to watch. And um, it was very enlightening. And <laughs> Best of luck. <laughs> yeah. Ramona leans over and purrs, like, call me, don't forget. And he's like, oh, yeah, I won't, I won't, I won't. And like, promptly got the hell out of yeah, there. Yeah. Like, what the fuck was that about? Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, he's like... <laughs> He actually says, oh, the things I have to go through in the name of research. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we could all use that one, couldn't we? Yeah, yeah. yeah. For science. For science. <laughs> yeah. And uh, a few days later, he, he, he decides to make a follow-up call to the motel, um, but Ramona had already checked out. Um, he then called her at a home number that she'd given in Oregon. Yeah. Um, and guess what? Number wasn't working. Right. Again. Surprise, surprise. Yeah. As he had suspected, it happened again. Yeah. Another vampire has come in, given false details and everything, yeah, and off into the night, so to speak. Um, it seems to be like a quite a common theme with regards to that. But there is quite a funny story that comes up in this about wrong numbers. And I <laughs> right. gave you a little. I think I gave you a little bit of a, a, a tidbit in it earlier. So one day he was reading um, an article in the Journal of Vampirism, for which he was actually a consultant. And the phone rang and the caller asked, is this Mr. Leach? I was like, well, I guess you could call me that if that's what you want to do. And you're the editor, right? Well, we don't have a, 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 an editor. I'm a consultant. Come on. I know, you're an, I know you're the editor. I've been reading the journal, the journal for over 10 years. Like, 10 years? Ten years. I said, it's only been out at two or three years most. Yeah. And the caller gets really angry. What kind of editor are you? You don't even know how often your paper comes out and then just hangs up. He's like, what the hell was the that? How was that? Yeah, yeah. That, that's the hell. Yeah, yeah. Like this. And <clears throat> um, he, uh, there was a few, quite a few sub- subsequent phone calls that were sort of like that, asking for a Mr. Leach. He's like, this is really weird. Mm. Like, 
But it, as it turns out, he did a little bit of digging into it. Yeah. And the Journal of Commerce, a highly respected New York publication, has a phone number only one digit different from the one that the centre had. Oh. Right? <laughs> and he had been receiving wrong number phone calls intended for them. Right. And he was like, oh, my God. Right, okay. So he calls up the, the, the Journal of Commerce and he operates. Who's calling, please? Um, this is Stephen Kaplan. And could you please tell me your editor's name? He said, Mr. Leach. He's like, Leach, are you sure? You're, you're not kidding me. He's like, that's his name. I can connect you now. So she connects him. And <laughs> yeah, it's uh, Mr. Leach. He, he opens Hello, Mr. Leach. Um, my name is Stephen Kaplan. And he goes, Stephen Kaplan. There really is a Stephen Kaplan. He's like, as far as I know, there is. Um, <laughs> anyway, I called to to tell you that I've been getting a lot of your phone calls and we have very similar phone numbers and I thought you should know. And he goes, you know what? I've been getting quite a few odd phone calls that are cl- clearly are meant for you too. You've got some really weird friends. <laughs> like, <laughs> he's like, yeah. Yeah, but, about that. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, but also they're probably not kidding because I'm a director of the Vampire Research Centre. And he was like, really? Are you serious? He's like, I'm dead serious. Explained what it was all about and what they were doing. And then they just fell about laughing on the phone. Like, oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> right. But if I get phone calls for you guys, I'll, I'll send them your way. Vice just, versa. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. How weird is that? But yeah. In fact, that both names have been like mentioned, but neither was in aware of their existence. Neither were aware of the other's existence. But like, could you imagine it though? Yeah. Like Mr. Leach. Of all the... Yeah. Of all the names. To Leech. Leech. So when they see Mr. Leech and they yeah. think they're calling the Vampire yeah. Society. Exactly. That makes sense. It's yeah. absolutely crazy. Yeah. Like that doesn't make, like, talk about coincidences mm. and such. Like it's one digit difference and they're looking for a Mr. Leech. Yeah. Ridiculous. It's nuts. Absolutely yeah. ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, so that was, that's the main bulk mm. of the book that we've got so far. Yeah. And... Now, I'm going to start talking about Elizabeth. Oh, okay. The 400-plus-year-old vampire right that so. called into the centre. Now, right. this was in the spring of 1979. Okay. Um, so we're looking at eight years into the centre being open now. So mm. they've been able to – they've so, had, yeah, they've uh, had yeah. okay. thousands of prank calls. Yeah. They've had hundreds of genuine calls, reports of vampirism, re- report uh, people professing to be – vampires and such and so they've got their they've got their criteria they've got their interview questions down they know what they're doing yeah. at this point so it's around eleven thirty at night on may the 13th and he was tired um he'd taken a couple of phone calls before that um and he had promised himself that this as the phone rang this is the last one and i'm going home i'm leaving the phones for the other people that are here um and obviously, he finds, oh, God, this is another prank call. Calling herself Elizabeth. She's over 400 years old. All right, okay. Yeah, Here we yeah. go, yeah. So initially, he didn't believe the call at all. Yeah. But within the next five minutes, he was suddenly wide awake. And that's because of they had a, a rapid, quick-fire questions and answers yeah. that she had no hesitation and her answers came really easily. Yeah. So not like it had been rehearsed or scripted or, or anything like that. Or just on the fly or yeah. anything like that. I mean, if you knew what they were going to ask, you could probably yeah, exactly. That's what I mean. it yeah. and rehearse yeah. it and whatnot. Um, and uh, she, it, it, this Elizabeth was articulate and rational and she was dead, dead serious. And she said that her name was Elizabeth, that she had been a vampire since she was about 17 or 18 years old and had been born in England somewhere around 1540. So she'd been living in Florida at this point for about 17 years. But before that, she had lived in Indiana for, quote, for quite a while. <laughs> However long Quite some be, time. For yeah. quite some time. So Kaplan asks, well, why did you call me? And she says that she hasn't talked to anyone about herself in a long, long time. And lately she's been a bit depressed, a bit lonely. Mm. And she had seen him on a TV show um, that she had videotaped and where he was talking about the centre and the research that they'd been doing yeah. and everything else and even some of the case studies that they had. Um, so he continues continues with the interview and he asks her, you know, 
what, what was your schooling? Where did you go to school? What, you know, and she goes, well, I have never had a formal education, but I do a lot of reading and I'm finally figuring out my physiological makeup. I was like, well, what do you mean? She said, well, I must have a liquid diet, a special one. Human blood is the only food my system can tolerate. And he goes, well, okay, so how long, uh, how often do you have to drink blood every day? So every day, every day you have to drink blood. She's like, yeah, well, how much do you drink? I've never measured it, um, but I guess about eight or nine pints. It's like, what, eight. every day? Yeah, yeah, eight or nine pints. It's like, where'd you get it from? Oh, I, I drain a human body. You drain a human body every day? Said, yeah. Well, how do you extract the blood? I choose one of the six major arteries, make a cut, and I drink. And drink. I usually, <laughs> usually use a straight razor. It's like, well, hang on, so... What do you do then? Do you do you tranquilize your victims or like how do you? Yeah, she goes definitely not. She's quite indignant about that. I'm like, definitely not. I won't pollute the blood with drugs. I'm also very careful to check for needle marks. I don't want to get a drug addict. I do. Okay. Um, well, can you tell me how you subdue your victims? No, no, no. Can't tell you that. Right. Okay. Um, so he continues to ask her all about her preferences. What, and she's not particularly fussy. Yeah. But she goes for a particular type of person, usually like a tourist or something like that. Um, and she goes, well, this was the bit that, that made him sit up a little bit straighter. Yeah. So, well, how do you feel when you're drinking the blood then? Hmm, well, that's hard to describe. Um, let me see. My feet get cold. Um, I can't hear anything. It's like, like a dreamless sleep or like, um, I guess yawning might describe it. At one point, the feeling gets very intense. And he goes, uh, how long does it go on for? Un until there's no need for blood. It takes around about 20 to 25 minutes. And oh. at this point, he's like, okay, well, no one else has ever given this answer before. No one's ever been able to describe what it feels like yeah. in such detail. Um, and this is when he really, really starts paying attention. So he asks, what do you sleep in? And she says, well, I have a special made sleeper. What, like a coffin? Of course, not a coffin. Like, I still need air. I still need air to breathe. Yeah. Um. So he, he asked, you know, when do you sleep during daylight hours? And she goes, well, I've, listen now, I've answered a lot of your questions. Um, I'd like to ask you some things yourself. He's like, it seems fair. Yeah. This, is, this is new. Yeah, yeah. I never had this part come from. Yeah, natural from, back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. So she asks, did you ever meet a male va vampire who said he had impregnated a? human female what you'd previously you spoken about said, yeah, yeah and uh he said well i let's say i've i've met some men who claim that they're vampires and also claim to have made a a, a woman pregnant yeah and she says well here's some information for your files nine out of ten male vampires are impotent it's a matter of hormones plus their body temperature is too cool to support healthy sperm cells another thing i'd like to ask you now is can you give me the names of any other vampires? So he thinks, well, okay, all right. Well, if I say, if I just pluck a name out of the air and she goes, oh, I know that one. Instantly, you I know, know it's you, rubbish. No, you're full of shit. Yeah, yeah. So he just gives her a name off the top of his head. Yeah. And she goes, oh, I've never heard of that one before. Oh, okay. All right. Fair okay. enough. So, yeah. so he's, he, he starts. Passed that test. Mm, yeah. Well done. Good. Well yeah. played. Well yeah. played. Yeah. Um, so he now asks her about other vampire behavioral patterns and those sort of things and, and whatnot. Um, and he asks her about her sex life and she doesn't like that at all. <laughs> she's like, I'm she, quite sharply. So I'm not interested in sex at all. And I will not discuss that subject with you. Fair enough. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, he's like, Touch I, I, enough. I don't yeah. mean to be offensive or anything like that, but yeah. it's just, these are some of the questions I have to ask. For the science. For science. <laughs> <laughs> Head first in. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, that's the way. Oh, oh, hey. I like it. <laughs> I like it. So she like she then goes on to describe herself. Um, she says, "I'm five foot two inches tall, and uh, I have a very nice shape. I've been told that I look anywhere between nineteen and twenty six years old." So he goes, "Well, do you look like a normal person?" <laughs> well, I don't know what that means. I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> yeah. So, well, do you look like something out of like the Martian comic strip or Vampirella or, or some something like that? You know, <laughs> like Masferatu or yeah, something. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but then you're like. 
creeping through the window or <laughs> yes, something yeah, like yeah. that. She's, she's like, she just, she laughs at that. She's just, Sounds so ridiculous. She, uh, he goes, well, what colour is your skin? She goes, well, I, I, I tell people that I'm albino and my eyes, if you were to look at them long enough, would be curious. They resemble glass, lead crystal. Um, the texture is different. Goes, well, can you describe it for me? She goes, how do I phrase this? Um, imagine, if you will, a piece of cloth and a piece of metal. When you shine light on the cloth, it goes through it and it's, it's dull and it's, it's diffused. But when you shine it on the metal, it bounces back. Well, it's the same basic idea as my eyes. Um, she said, I can, it's, it's like my eyes are crystalline. So they're not made of tissue, but they're crystalline. And I can see the smallest line on a dollar bill at 50 paces. Oh, wow. She's like, oh, wow, okay. So impressive. This, she, she talks about um, the crystalline structures. And as it turns out, though, this call was made in 1979. Right. And in 1984, they actually discovered that there was um, two crystal-like proteins that develop in the lens of our eyes. No way. So it's, it's quite cool that... She'd that already one. confirmed it and then it actually gets proven years later. Yeah, 19, like about five years later. Time. Yeah. Which I thought was an interesting thing. that Because I thought, well, when did... Because I do know that there, there's the idea of crystalline proteins in our irises. Right. And I suppose with age, those crystals would form yeah i guess um so the interview continues for a little bit longer and then worriedly she goes i have to hang up now he goes yeah well yeah you know we've been talking for some time now elizabeth um you're very fascinating i must say uh, mm. is there any chance that you're going to call again she goes, oh no 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 I, I probably will hate myself for, for weeks for making this call you'll never hear from me again but i needed to talk and you have cheered me up considerably thank you dr kaplan she hangs up the phone fair enough and now <laughs> he's now sitting again what the what? hell was yeah. that? Like, wow. Mm. What an interview. Wowzers, yeah. Like, absolutely incredible. So he starts yeah. talking to his colleague, Roxanne, in this case. And at first, they're, init- they're inclined to think that she's a hoax because they'd never, ever received a phone call like that. It's an original hoax at the very least. It went far too well to the point where he actually doesn't believe it. Exactly. Because it went so well, yeah. Exactly. But what was so intriguing about the call was what some of the things that they spoke about and also about her location. So being in Florida and recently at this point, they had had several um, very good leading reports of vampire activity in Florida. Right. So they're thinking, well, maybe it could be coincidental. Yeah. But you know what we feel about coincidences. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Such. Yeah. But anyway, so six weeks later, Elizabeth calls back. Um, and this time it's around about three o'clock in the morning. Oh, wow. Right. Um, and he conducted the same interview questions, specifically looking for holes in the story. Yeah. And her answers were short and they were the same as before. And <laughs> they were accompanied with, I already told you that. <laughs> yeah. I've already told you this. Yeah. Why, why are you asking again? Like getting quite, <laughs> yeah, yeah. quite short with him. Um, and he tried to draw a bit more information out of her. And, and although she was worried about her security, the mental lift that she had gotten from the last conversation was so great that she risked calling him again. Yeah. So she actually enjoyed it. Wow. Um, and uh, so, that again, very much the same phone call as before happened. And she ended it with, well, I've got to go now. I've got to go out to, to dinner. We know what that means. Oh, yes. Yeah. So he's going for takeout. That's, for what, that, takeout. that's yeah. what that means. Fast um, food. <laughs> exactly. So after that, he decided that he was going to keep a tape recorder next to the phones from now on, just because he believed that she would call back again. Yeah. And he was bang on the money. Yeah. Because that was, they were the first two calls in a long string of phone calls for about six months right. that Elizabeth had called back. And he says it was fascinating, incredible, even awesome to speak to this woman. But going through the conversations became quite tedious at times, he says, that because Elizabeth loved to talk, sometimes like three hours at a time. What the hell? Like, you can imagine that. Yeah, like, yeah. It's like midnight. Oh, come on. Yeah, you're three in the morning, go, yeah. You're ready to, they, the whole centre, basically, they ended up being in a, a bustle for months. So completely changing their work schedules, everything, just to make sure. They were around they for were a phone around call. They were around for Elizabeth's yeah. phone call. Wow. Um, because the whole... It, so the story that she that she told him was so puzzling and mysterious 
and what he says so chillingly possible as yeah. well. Yeah, so yeah. it's it's almost like he's on the verge of being convinced by her. That's bad. So the following phone conversations, um, the entire staff would listen to the tapes, make analyses, and draw up some a list of questions for him to ask the next time she called. Of course, yeah. They would purposely repeat questions, ask same things out of context, and try to trap... Waiting for her to correct them or... Yeah. Trying to trap her in a line. Right, yeah. You know, um, and it was... The next call was in July, uh, July 19th, 1979. And it started off like the regular sort of phone calls. How are you doing? How much blood you've been drinking? <laughs> yeah. da, 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 da. Um, a little further into the into the conversation, Elizabeth told a chilling story. Right. She goes, oh, I had something very interesting happen. I was stopped at a light and uh, I didn't have my car doors locked. And this guy runs up and up to the car and jumps in. He takes out a knife and says, drive. Um, I was in a hurry and had to get someplace and I really didn't have time to deal with this man. Um, <laughs> get out of my car, I told him. He didn't seem to be amused by that. And as, you'd, said, ima- as you'd imagine. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. You, like I've this, got, I'm the one with the knife. You're five foot two, love. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pipe down. Yeah. You're 400 years old. What are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What are you going to do? <laughs> you old bint. <laughs> <laughs> um, she's a drive lady or else. And she laughed. Like, this is what he said to me. It's ridiculous. She goes, okay, if you say so. And uh, so I drove and that's never happened to me before, she goes. So, um, so what happened in the end? Well, I, I, did what I, I did what I had to do. It's like, well, might we say he's no longer going to be a threat to the world? Mm. Could say that, yeah. You could put it that way. That's what she says. <laughs> well, like already. Oh, mate, it's, it, like, this, this f- scares the hell out of him. Just how her casualness, Blase, yeah. how casualness of yeah. allegedly killing someone and then just telling him about it, just it just chilled him right down to his core. Um, he later inquired um, about putting a, a tracing device on the phone, but was told that since like he never knew when Elizabeth was going to call, yeah. it just wouldn't be feasible. Plus, you've got to try and convince the telephone company to put a tracer on that line, yeah. and they'd already had enough n- enough trouble trying to get the fucking phone number in the directory. So they're not going to convince. Not going to do that as well. Yeah, yeah I'm trying to track a vampire. Yeah. What? No, right. no. Yeah, we, not... we draw the line there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we look, look, we let you have a bloody number. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, he he then asks us, well, how much blood are you drinking these days? Um, I know you told me that you don't measure it, but I just thought I'd ask again. Yeah, yeah. Again, trying to keep catch her in a lie. She goes, oh, that's right, I, I don't measure it, but since we last talked, I looked it up, and it's something like uh, five or six liters. I have a book here, Anatomy and Physiology. And now he intentionally tries to throw her off. Yeah. No, no, that, that that's wrong. You're wrong. Um, I've done quite a bit of research on that, Elizabeth. Uh, you don't have six quarts in here, in you. It, it, there's no way. Yeah, yeah. Quartz is just under a litre. Right. Um, well, good grief. This is a, a textbook that people are studying in college and to, like, to become doctors and nurses. Yeah. Um, oh, yes, it, it it does. It says that. I'll, was zero, I'll Xerox it and I'll send it to you. And he's like... Brilliant. She's going to send something to me. I've got an address that I can trace. Um, she later goes on to say that all the the, the, the vampire li- myths and legends are just utter nonsense. Her teeth look <laughs> normal, except for two that are slightly longer than the rest, which she says, you could call them fangs, I suppose, uh, but I don't like that word. Right. Um, she had repeatedly met, recently met a male vampire in Florida whom she had known and last seen in 1863 or thereabouts. And she says that they kind of do like a dual double take, like a, <gasps> you, it's you, yeah. you, like this. Yeah, but they yeah. don't say anything to each other. It's just kind of like a, a mutual kind I of, see yeah, you. recognition. I see you. Yeah. Kind of thing. And apparently they leave each other alone and he has his side of the state. She has hers. Right. Um, she gave some interesting um, information about her past. Uh, she was born in either Folkestone or Canterbury, around about that okay, area yeah. in England. And uh, she was at the Tower of London at approximately 1556 or 57, awaiting beheading for having become a Protestant. Um, she was carrying a, in just like incriminating letters for her boyfriend at the time, Thomas Wilfield, and had been caught. Um, she had a basic, she, she had a choice. She could either confess yeah. and um, be hanged, but she'd, she'd go to heaven because she's, a, she's now Catholic. She's converted, course, yeah. she's a Catholic now. Um, or she could stay as a Protestant and, um, oh, no, 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 sorry. She would 
be burnt at the stake if she um, professed to be in, if she, if she uh, what's the word, converted yeah. back to Catholicism. So she'd be burnt at the stake or she'd be beheaded if she remained a Protestant. So she's like, well, I'm going to remain a Protestant, thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I yeah. You think I'm going to hell? I'm, I think I'm not. Yeah. Um, I'm there already, doesn't exactly. matter. Yeah. If I burn, <laughs> yeah. the, the fire will cleanse me yeah. and I'll go to heaven. Yeah. Yeah, sure, that's how that works. Yeah, yeah. Um, so she decided to keep her mouth shut, chose beheading over being burnt at the stake. Makes sense. Um, and uh, so the captain, like, well, what happened then? She says, well, she gets a little bit tongue-in-cheek here. <laughs> In through the window flies Peter Pan. Um, I was not asked to do this or to do that. I was just told, here, put these clothes on, um, cut your hair, and let's go. And she says, that's where... That's when I th- I went through the vicissitudes or changes to us English people, yeah, uh, us English speakers, <laughs> and uh, he starts he starts asking her about um, the various different. Uh, so what happened to you then? What happened? She's like, oh, well, I'm, not, I'm not ready to talk about that. He goes, okay, okay, we'll we'll leave that for another time. Um, he starts asking about the various different variations that there might be per night. Yeah, that's to. Who who are victims are? She goes, oh, I don't like the word victims. Call them a mark. They're a mark, <laughs> like a fucking assassin. Yeah, you know, like no, no, no. Yeah. If it, if she calls them victims, then it humanizes them yeah. too much. Um, she goes, well, wow. He says, well, how how many roughly per week would you say? Like maybe ten per week. She goes, oh yeah. He says it, it depends on my cycle. <laughs> so I don't. Know, does that mean <laughs> her cycle? A cycle, cycle, a cycle, or a cycle, feeding like, cycle. Yeah, I don't know quite. It doesn't go into detail about that, right. but that's kind yeah. of what I'm suspecting. But I'm not saying anything more about it no, or no. asking any more about it because, no, no. because, just because. <laughs> yeah. So um, at this point, Carol, um, another member of the team, actually asks her a question, and it's one that she, they've asked her before. So why exactly is it that you're calling? Yeah. She says because there's something about Stephen that interests me. And he's and Stephen, and he's. Well, what specifically is there? He said, well, you seem to be very intelligent. You seem to have your head straight on straight. And uh, there must be some sort of psychology to that. In as much as to be recognised as a person for what it is that I am before anything else means a lot. And to be recognised as a person by someone who knows what I have done and am doing is somehow good. Although I may be risking my security. And that too, yeah. So it's that... Uh, regardless of what she's said and done, yeah, he's still talking to her like a person and not a monster. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's very. She's fair. Yeah, it's very Mary Shelley. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? It's very like seen beyond monster the, Frankenstein yeah. sort of thing. Um, so he asks her, like, is it possible, you know, for a sample of your blood? Like, could you mail it to us? You know, drop it on a bit of glass slide and send it over. Wrap yeah. it up. He goes, well, that's very peculiar. Um, I'll think about it. And uh, he he tries to appeal to a better nature and says, like, you know, you, you your long life could actually it might be a secret to that in your blood, and you could probably help help people. people yeah. She says, well, the one thing that has occurred to me over the years is that I have been exposed to all sorts of viruses, bacteria, diseases, everything from typhoid to polio. I must have a very powerful antibodies in my blood. And uh, he goes, well, do you mind being a vampire? She says, well. As that is academic, it's difficult to say. Vampires are usually seen as evil, and wouldn't you like to change that? Again, trying to appeal to a better nature. She said, "Well, I don't, I don't, don't really know what would be changed, and I'd hate to think that this could develop into a, like a three ring circus." Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, because I don't mean putting you on exhibit. I mean that you could actually help people instead of taking their lives. You could. Give them. Save people, yeah. you know, like if there's something in your blood that could cure a disease or something like this. Yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't that be a great gift to mankind? Yeah. And she makes a very good point here. People in general are stupid. What's the point in saving them? <laughs> so, <laughs> there should be a bumper sticker or. <laughs> <laughs> like, mm, I can't help she it. She has a point. She <laughs> has a point. She really does. Um, and I realise that I'm I'm overrunning here a little bit, so I'm going to scoot through a lot of this in in the interest of time. But okay, one thing that that she does come up with, she comes up again with some more history about herself. So Roxanne jumps on on the questions as well and asks Elizabeth if she remembers anything about the Civil War. And Elizabeth says yes, in 
In fact, she was in the middle of Sherman's March. Um, to those that have studied yeah. the American Civil War will know what that is. I, not so much. I didn't no, get a so chance no. to look into that. Um, she'd been trying to stay out of the direct line of battle, but was going in the wrong direction, headed for the sea. Um, she was between Atlanta and Charleston. Then Roxanne asked her uh, when she first came to the country, and she answered just before the Revolutionary War in 1775, um, on a boat whose name that she thought was the Farragut. Um, it was very crowded. Those things, I don't know where in the world people got the idea that they were seaworthy. Now, that's interesting because that's a researchable yeah, fact. That's something tangible that you can actually look at. But it's a researchable fact. Yeah. So it's certainly something that you could research and then incorporate into your story. Yeah, true. Well. Yeah, true. Um, the, the phone call carries on and you know, it says she's got to go. She's got to go put her, her out clothes on because she's ready to go out. Right. And he's like, well, what is that? Is that a, like yeah. a cape and oh, a hat? Yeah. Is yeah, 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 yeah. And she laughs and, no, no, just a regular pair of pants, some sneakers, jumper. I'm just going to go out. Right. You know, nothing nothing too crazy. Yeah. Um, and uh, he asks us, well, how do you go about it? Where will you be going? She says, well, I'll go south because I went lo- I went north last night. Do you do the opposite every night? No, just something different. Um, she says, I'll drive for a ways and then stop. Then I'll walk for a ways. Um, how long I travel, it just depends. I'd go until I, my sixth sense or whatever tells me, okay, stop here, and then I'll go on in, in a different direction, and I'll go in that direction, wherever my mind takes me. So she has like a body compass sort of thing that yeah, like kind of ESP. drives her to, yeah. Like extra sensory perception or something yeah. like that that just guides drives her. Drives her to where she needs, yeah, the to, source of. To wherever yeah. she needs to be to to get that victim. Um, or that mark. Well, that mark. She yeah. finds her They're mark. not victims, yeah. No. <laughs> um, she says that she prefers tourists. Um, for one thing, most people are not very bright. <laughs> she carries on. Um, half of them don't even bother to with traveller's checks. The other half never inform anyone where they're going <coughs> or how long they're going to be. Yeah. Um, and they wouldn't be missed for months. Um, she actually confesses to um, consuming a mark putting him back in his car and pushing the car into a body of water. And she says, I know for a fact that that still hasn't been found for two months. So people, wow. people go missing and no one yeah. even realizes it. Oh, wow. Okay. Now this, this next bit, um, they start talking about, um, what he actually is like to become a vampire. Yeah. So what is actually needed? Right. Um, she, she's, she says usually by the age of 24, um, that's the the point. Anything over 24, 25, 26, no go. Like you're too old to be a vampire or too something. Old, yeah, right. absolutely. She said by 24, the body is dying at such a fast rate that it would never survive. Well, well that makes Christ, me Christ, well, that explains a lot. Yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah. It really does, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, about mid-20s, it's all downhill from there. Yeah. <laughs> According yeah. to the four hundred year old. Yeah, according, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, yeah. And she said that she's never turned. She she would never have turned anyone over the age of twenty five, and she's never actually done it herself. Right. Um, ask why <laughs> she's never. <laughs> You're right there. Yeah, it lost me pen. <laughs> <laughs> Got to be excited. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> so, ask why she's never actually turned anyone into a vampire. She yeah. says it's responsibility. I don't want the responsibility of a new vampire running around yeah. doing their thing. I'd, yeah. I'd, I've done well enough by myself, quite frankly. Um, she gives some details about having um, a daylight secretary as well that takes care of all of her comings and goings, all her business interests yeah. and everything. So you would ask, okay, well, what, how do you get your money? And apparently she gets her money from real estate. So she's got a couple of different properties that she's got a regular stream yeah. of income, a bloodstream of... Bloodstream, good. A bloodstream yeah. of income. <laughs> oh. um, and... It turns out that this secretary of hers is the intended for the other vampire that's in Florida, the one that she caught right. eyes yep. with. Gotcha. Yep. Um, and intended, basically what that means is when her training's over, she will go through the changes. Yeah. Um, she's around about 20 at the moment. So she's got a couple more years of um, uh, uh, of her training, of her understanding and, and the such as a human. Yeah. And then she'll be changed afterward. Right. Um, he even asked, does she secure, like, your marks. She's like, like, does she help you? She's like, of course not. You do ask them stupid questions. Like, <laughs> it's like really quite, really yeah. quite patronising to him. And um, uh, 
she later on says that you know she she goes through this really interesting way of describing how she's feeling when she first wakes up when she needs the blood um it's quite convoluted i won't go through it because uh, i don't think i really quite understand what she's saying and i don't think he does either uh, right um, okay but yeah it's, it's an interesting one and maybe i'll put it on on the, yeah. the socials or something like that, and people can share the excerpt or something yeah. for people to see. Yeah, I'll, I'll, okay. I'll take a screenshot of the page or something yeah, like okay. that, and you guys can have a look at it. Um, so he asked her, Well, where did you get your training from? She says, Well, my lord, I, the one that yeah. changed me. And said, well, you know, have you, you know, do you still see him? Do you keep in touch? You know, yeah, yeah. You know do you ring on, ring him up on Pen the phone? Pals and, yeah, or, yeah, you know, yo, what's up? On Facebook, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sub sucker, and all that, you know. <laughs> Um, she said, I haven't heard from him um, in, well, let's see, didn't see him in the 70s or the 60s or the 50s, probably 1920, mid-20s, something like that. It's like, wow, okay, well, who is he? She said, well, I forget what I called him before, but I know him as Michael now. He's been Michael since 1860 or so. Okay, right. Okay, well, she says that he's kind of like um, he's taken the parent role sort of thing, and um, it keeps... He keeps her in. He kept her in check. Yeah, and it turns out that actually, what happened was she she kind of outgrew him, and they got tired of each other. He went one way, she went another, and it's been that way for nearly yeah. well, nearly a hundred years. Over mm. hundred hundred years, they've been away from each other. Um, or by this point, at the very least. Yeah, yeah. Um, the interview continues, and. Uh, he starts asking about the actual change. It seems like she's ready to ask to answer the questions. Right. She says, "What process is done? Did did they give you like a, a chemical or anything like that?" And she says, "Well, no, no, no. It's it was very much practically practically a cult back then." She says, um, "She had to wear a white gown, and she was locked in a room for three days. And when the room was unlocked, she was told to go and find Michael. And she says it took her about three hours. But when she found him, there were seventeen candles lit." Presumably because she was 17 as well. And um, as they, he, he, he took her wrist and said, you, know, you have to calm down now. Yeah. And it turns out it's um, a transfusion process of blood. So Michael cut his arm um, and offered his arm to her after he had drunk her, drunk her blood. So right. he bit her on the neck. She said, she Drank her blood and then he offered his as, right. Absolutely. Um, and, he he asked her, well, how how exactly is it that he did give you the blood? She says, oh, well, I don't know. I, was, I kept going in and out of consciousness at that point. I'd lost a lot of blood. Yeah, okay. Said, okay, well, that makes sense. Yeah, that's right. Um, and she says, um, as, a, as an added note here, she said, making a vampire is making, like a, is making a baby. It's like making a baby. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> the science is still out on that, she jokes. At <laughs> <laughs> so this point, Stephen goes... Science! <laughs> for the research. For science! Let's get in there. And lead, the, lead, the, lead the charge. Um, now that he starts asking her about where, um, do you know about any other vampires that are in the country? Like Vampires like you. Yeah. Um, and uh, she says, you know, well, there's about, mm, I would say there's probably about 10, including me, um, right. dotted all over the country. Um, turns out the other vampire in Florida is called Joaquin. So we've now got his okay. name as well. Um, what about in Canada? So, well, I don't know about Wisconsin because he knows that he's received some reports from That's Wisconsin. From, yeah. Um, she said, well, maybe there might be one in Wyoming, but I don't know any in Wisconsin. Um, she said, well, they could be jumping borders. You know, well, what about, um, Canada again, Nova Scotia, Toronto? So, well, I don't know, but I was in Nova Scotia once on a vacation. And he goes, oh, okay, what, what year? She said, well, let me see. Um, da, 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 da. It turned out it was 1977 that she was up there. And this amazed him because they had received vampire reports from Nova Scotia during the winter of 1977. And she had been there wow. reportedly. Again, that's something that's possibly... As well. Researchable though, isn't it? Possibly. That's a possibility. Yeah. It depends on whether or not those reports that they had received at the centre were shared. Were shared yeah, from another course, authority. Yeah. Or, or if they went to somewhere else to share it. Obviously, Absolutely. Social media wouldn't have been around. So Well toward that this point in in the uh, age of the centre, the police had actually contacted them to become specialist consultants on cases. Right. Okay. So 
that is a possibility. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll show you this. This was one of the, the things that she had um, actually sent over uh, as mm. part of a package, and it's right. a handwritten note, all in cursive. Yeah, yeah. Very hard to read. Yeah, he's very hard to the, read. The scan isn't great. Yeah. Um, but it's all in cursive, and she signed it, Elizabeth. Um, and such. So along with that, she also sent over a load of photographs of people that she'd known in the past hundred years, um, samples of her handwriting, both cursive and calligraphy, a poem she had written, yeah, um, and a photocopy of the page of the medical journal that detailed the facts about blood, because she said that she was going to send it over. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was also blueprints for her sleeper, the, the most recent one that she had made. Wow. Notes on how much blood that she had been drinking. Mm. And a personal letter to Kaplan, which you just yeah, saw. Yeah, just saw, yeah. Um, Did he transcribe it at all or or sort of explain what the letter said? Or There's there's a little bit here that um, it does say part of it, part of the letter follows, I never do anything on the spur of the moment. I have not lived this long by being careless or impulsive. I must feel secure. And I give you my word that as long as I do not, as I do not believe you have sacrificed my own security in any way, I will never so much as raise my voice to you. Wow. This promise I make that you may be as comfortable as possible. So wow. as long as he's been accommodating. She will be. She's not going to raise her she's voice. She's not going to kill him. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, okay. That's cool. Yeah. Let's get through a little bit more of this. It's really interesting it, uh, story. The fact this woman actually you know, has existed at some point and she's, you know, seems quite articulate and, you she's know, and educated and it's, it's, it's examples like this that make you think, mm. Mm, okay. Oh, don't get me wrong, mate. I there mean, might be I'm, something here, you know, I like, am leaving you know, out a fair old very believable. If, if, if it's, if it's nonsense, then it, it's a very good elaborate, you know, sort of story. It, it, one that would take a lot of effort to upkeep, especially with asking, repeating the questions, yeah. giving the same answer, knowing that they'd asked, you know, the same sort of question like this, that takes a lot of work. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's, she starts talking about like things about like the physiology and everything else like this, but you've got to remember as well, these calls are taking place over a, a six month period. Yeah. And right. it's the, the, the level of detail that she's provided in this. And I've, I've emo omitted a lot of it in the interest of time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because we, we <laughs> can't take yeah. up too much time yeah. here. Yeah. And, yeah. And such. Um, but he does ask her, like, you know, look, to be honest, I need to categorise you in some way at this point now. Mm. Um, we have you, you, you can choose one of one of four yeah. different options. Right, you can categorise yourself as um, a real vampire, or a vampire-like person, a hoax, or an unknown. And he's be honest with me. How would you categorise yourself? Which one would you pick? Yeah, you said honestly. I would have to say unknown. It says a good way for us to get you from an unknown to a real vampire would be to have a sample of your blood. <laughs> you know, it doesn't have to be beneath your dignity to do this. Mm. Um, we have a hematologist on, on staff on site, that can yeah. analyze it for us. Is it possible? And she goes, no, 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 I'm not, no, I'm not willing to do that anymore. I've previously said that because she had previously said about that it. It, was, yeah. it was beneath her to do it. And right, she's yeah. decided no. Yeah, because you know, she says I always want an out. So he later asks her to send a picture of her teeth. Mm. Um, and she doesn't know because I want an out. Yeah, what a way of getting out of this and such. And it's it's like she is getting one thing that she's getting from this is that she can, um, she's able to talk to someone and keep it keep herself removed from it. Yeah, keep, so, a, keep a certain distance without absolutely. getting too close. And well, this is just it. The well, presumably, blood would also give an identity yes, as absolutely. well. So yeah, you know, and once you've got that on file, mm. certainly in the late seventies, going into the eighties, you can you've got a sample of it. You can yeah. DNA profile it yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. So if that DNA profile comes up anywhere, we know where yeah. we know where to go with it. Yeah. Um, the ultimate call, the last call that they that he ever receives from her. Um, it starts off with just ringing through to the answer phone. And uh, Elizabeth calls and says, Stephen, this is Elizabeth. I'm calling tonight. I saw you on your show and not just heard your sincerity, but I saw your insincerity. And know that 
I know you to be an intellectual, honourable person and good in your way. I'm sorry and dishonoured. I'm a fraud. I deceived you. Steve, I thank you for your honour and wish you Godspeed and the safety in your work. You've done an, uh, done me a great deal of... and in, He runs to the phone. He's like, no, 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 no. Picks it up. This is Stephen Kaplan. Elizabeth, how, how have you deceived me? Like, what? Yeah, yeah. What, what do you mean? She says, well, I've, I've used you rather selfishly. He goes, in what way? She said, I've wanted to know certain things and, and things that were necessary to me, and I've used you to find them out. And he's like, well, what do you mean? Like, what, do you, what is it that you've found out, and how is it that you've deceived me? There's a long pause. I, um, I told you um, I can't tell anyone a, a, a lie right to them. I just can't do it. He's, like, he's confused by this. He yeah. said, well, just tell me the Speak truth. Speak woman. Tell yeah. me the truth then. Mm. She said, I was going to tell you that I was not a, a, a vampire. Really? And what, what are you? Well, I am. And it's, what are you? She, a vampire. She, Can you remember if you're a vampire or not? Elizabeth, come on. Will you tell me the truth, please? She said, I have. Flat, unemotional voice, unlike unlike previous times where she had a bit yeah, of yeah. personality. Yeah, yeah. You have what? Told you the truth. And even at this point, when I'm reading it, I'm like, I don't understand. I don't get what she's... What, yeah. what are you saying? Yeah. What are you saying, girl? Is the truth that you're lying or the truth that you're yeah. a vampire? Yes. Yeah. And, and which truth is that? That you're an actress or someone who believes you are a vampire? And she goes, whatever suits you. <laughs> oh, for fuck's sake. I know, right? <laughs> oh, here we go. Joking. Haven't we all been there? <laughs> fuck's sake. <laughs> And he's like, yeah. no, 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 no. You, t- you, you, you called that's me. That's not what you yeah. are saying, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. I want you to tell me the truth, please. And she goes, I know what I am. That is enough for me. Said, yes. But, but you see, you've told me a lot of things after all of these hours that we've had these phone calls and I'm yeah. waiting for the true, true story. Yeah. Do you think you might tell me? And she's, why is it necessary? Why? Because you've taken a lot of my time. Yeah. Uh, my I want to know research. whether it's been wasted or the, not. The scent yeah. has been in like an uproar for months yeah. because of your phone calls. Like, yeah. You know, d- d- at least owe me that. Exactly. Yeah. And then yeah. she says, I, I haven't lied to you at any time until tonight. Like, right. Okay. Well, what have you lied about tonight? Well, when I got your recording, I assumed you had probably gone to bed. Um, I was, she says, it's not a hoax but you would be more comfortable with it if it were a hoax. It was, yeah. So she's saying that she's not a hoax, but categorise it as a hoax, please. Right. Because I think now... She's getting too much heat because she's seen him on telly. He's getting too much attention. Yeah. And is he going to share her story and so will it bring it all to... At this point, <clears throat> she's she's begging him to call her a hoax. Right, okay. Begging him to call her a hoax. Okay, well, that's different, I guess. Absolutely. But. And then they... they part ways mm. amicably. Yeah. Um they each say, you know he he he's like, oh, well, well this is all this time wasted then. You yeah. must be a hoax. Um and she, he goes, Yes, I know that. Well, that's all right. We're going to let you go and bow out now anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um were you auditioning for a part for all like all these calls that you that you made mm. to us? And she says, You really do think I'm a hoax? Well, good. Good night. And then she hangs up. <laughs> like, wow. Sake. What a way to end it. Yeah, yeah. Now, he adds something to the end of this story. On October 27th, 1981, the Boston Globe quoted 24-year-old James P. Reaver II on trial for murder as saying, I've been a vampire for four years. Later on in that article, his mother quoted... He told me he had met vampires in Florida and that he knew some were 200 years old. What do you think? Oh. <laughs> what a story. What a story indeed, yeah. That was a good, uh, that was a good old little find there, man, yeah. It was good. Uh, yeah, I, just, <clears throat> I don't know. I don't know. It, it could go one of... You know, one of two ways, couldn't it? Really, I mean, yeah. you know, sound, you know, very intelligent, very articulate, you know, very sure of herself and her story, and you know, did he, you know, did Kaplan get too much attention that she inadvertently thought, well, shit, that means I'm going to start getting too much attention, and so if mm. it was a hoax, she didn't want to be embarrassed 
you know, globally or nationally or whatever, yeah. as being a you know being a wind up and a you know a liar and stuff, or is it the other way that she actually does truly believe that that that's who she is and she didn't want the same attention, <clears throat> you know, similarly like you know yeah. she didn't want the heat, didn't want, and the exposure. Didn't want the exposure, yeah, exactly. So or was she really a four hundred plus year old vampire? That's what I mean. Yeah, was she really? Gave all of that information. Or she really that that offered it all up to yeah. someone who she could confide in, not knowing that he was maybe going to get the the press and the coverage mm. that he did, which is why she then had to retreat and be like, "Oh no, that no, was all rubbish." Yeah. yeah, don't don't tell anyone that 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 was between you know. So yeah, I mean, it, it could be either, and it's it, I think it's that well that well done. Yeah. I think it's hard to well, you know, and he's talked to a lot of these... kooks, and he's got other examples of ones that you know are less. You know they're they're, mm. they're disingenuous. You know they're, they're they're less believable, and then he offers up that one, and so comparatively, yeah, you're more likely to believe that than like the others mm. with the you know the woman that was just trying to trap him to you know offer him up to you know some sort of weird cult ritual and that exactly. kind of thing. Whereas this is actually like you know she's answered questions, she's asked questions, she's given an actual timeline and things that are you know mm. factual, but admittedly are researchable as well. So she could have preempted a backstory exactly you know and, and that kind of thing yeah. so yeah i don't know if it's a hoax it's an elaborate one it's um, very very elaborate. elaborate and you know the storyteller in me is just like yeah that's awesome like, uh, like no, that, right. that's incredible that's i mean i've i've of, condensed an already yeah. condensed transcript of these conversations yeah. um yeah exactly what i'll do is if anyone's interested in it in yeah. taking a read of this themselves there's a pdf file that I can share the link on our our socials. Yeah, I'll send it over to you. You can get it on Twitter. Yeah, um, definitely. I'll get it on Facebook, Instagram, or whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's an incredible read. Yeah, it's, it's it, a good. One. It works yeah. out about uh, forty eight pages. Right. That's all dedicated to her, her, and that interview or yeah. series of interviews. Yeah. Mm. Part of me's thinking. I like it. Part of me's thinking that in the early seventies, um, Anne Rice's mm. novel yeah. came out. Yeah. Um. And this is late seventies, mm. so is it Hot. bit of a fan fan fiction? Because it's thing. an interview with a vampire. Yeah, quite frankly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. The, exactly. Yeah. The, the level of detail that she goes into, and just his account of it, of, of how she spoke, and how eloquent, how articulate, and how there was no hesitation to her answers. Mm. It was just straight up. So it well, wasn't preempted, wasn't that. scripted, and it, it seemed genuine. And mm. yeah, the way that she sort of seemingly carried herself and. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. Like I say, yeah, if, if it's if it's a hoax and it's a you know very good one, was she an aspiring author and she wanted to try out her story on someone, you know, to see if it would be believable? Mm. Was she you know an actress, you know, going you know going for a role or something? Or yeah, was it just a yeah, was it just a wind up? Was it just a lonely lady wanting some companionship? And yeah, she was a fan of yeah Anne Rice, and that's how it all kind of manifested itself. It, it's. Normally, when you when we listen or read to these things, you and I can kind of listen to it and think, "Yeah, no, that's nonsense." Because you, yeah. you know, you get to a certain point and you think, "No, you've lost me now." Or absolutely, or you you, you listen to something and you think, "No, that definitely happened," or that that's just too good to be not true. Sort and of like thing. I said, I've omitted a lot. Yeah, with the interest of time. Yeah, as well, and it the 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 detail that she goes into about physiology of the vampire yeah. her teeth are different as well when yeah that was one of the things that kaplan was trying to get her to do take a picture of her teeth and yeah send them over to him we've all tried that one <laughs> yeah. go on babe take a picture of your teeth <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's your teeth that i want to see go on babe yeah, yeah, go on. yeah. <laughs> get your teeth out yeah we're all guilty of that one that is, that is very true send me a picture of yourself for the science. For science. <laughs> sort of research, research babe. Yeah, research. Yeah, yeah. yeah, just research. <laughs> but yeah, um, I'm so glad I, I, I brought yeah, that up, I, to be honest. It's, no, man, that's a wicked story. And I think it helped that you started off with the initial stories and, and interactions that you had when you first when he first started the association mm. and stuff that it was all that oh come on that's just they're just creeps or weirdos or yeah they're just homeless they're you know they're part of a weird cult and then you can you could identify early on which yeah. at what point it was like yeah no that's just well, it's eight years into the, yeah. the center being open by the point that he gets that first call from her yeah so they've been they've, they've got whittling down idiots to a fine art yeah, so exactly. That, so would he have hear wasted the cadence in people's voices where they? Mm, yeah, uh, mm, uh. he would have known by then whether she was disingenuous, whether she, it was a wind up, whether she was lying. Because he even tried to catch her out, didn't he? Many on, times, on a number of occasions, and colleagues of his tried to do the same. And she was very good at keeping, you know, to the same, uh, mm. you know, to the same story. So, um, yeah, I, I suppose, yeah, I guess coming off the fence, if I'd be, I'd be more likely to believe her. 
and believe I that know, she right? is who she says she is because there's not enough from what you've gone through for me to kind of pick at in terms yeah. of like a thread to be like, nah, come on, no, that's just the, you know. Like he says. It's very good. It's chillingly possible. Yeah. That yeah, exactly. she is what she is. And like I said, guys, I've omitted a lot. So yeah. I will, actually, I said I might, I will. I'll put yeah. the link out there, guys. You can download yeah. the PDF, have a read yourselves because it is an incredible read. It's an incredible yeah. read. Yeah, I mean, they're just, um, you know, interviews and some interactions with some individuals. Um, I did find some stuff on some associations and stuff, but in the interest of time, I'm not gonna, okay. not going to be yeah, able to I, go through them. But, I have uh, overrun a fair yeah. bit, didn't I? <laughs> but um, <laughs> th- there was one, there's one that's been set up in Atlanta um, okay, cool. called the Atlanta Vampire Alliance. Um, they, yeah, it, it's basically like, um, like, like, like a, a fa- like a Facebook group essentially for like pe- like-minded people, basically gotcha. people that think they're, you know, um, vampires. It's just a, a safe space for, you know, them to come together and gotcha. indulge in their practices and their beliefs and almost like the religion of it. Mm. Um, so they've it's got not like a, an intervention group, like a no. Blood Drinkers Anonymous or something like well, that. Well, no, they do <laughs> mention that, but the, the thing for me that makes me think this is just kind of fantasy gotcha. is the fact that, they they admit they obviously openly admit they don't drink human blood because obviously it's illegal and there's the health concerns and that so they only mm-hmm. reside themselves to drinking animal blood, right? So straight off the bat, that's not you know that's not a vampire. They they don't do the role playing and the Based RPG on stuff and categorizations, isn't it? Well, yeah. and that as well, mm. yeah. Um, and also what we know or believe to know of a vampire and that you you know drinking human mm. you know, sort of blood and whatever. Um, and yeah, they've got their different sort of classifications. Um, you know, you either um, they they either get their energy source from drinking blood, or they get it from feeding off the energy yeah. of people. So their physical life force, um, mm-hmm. and then there's a hybrid of the two. Um, and yeah, they they sort of get together, they have meetups, and it's more of a kind of uh, support group, I guess. Yeah. Um, from what I could tell, um, it, there's no like yeah role playing and you know kind of cosplay and all that kind of thing. They're very yeah. and, you know, some of these people are like doctors. Like PhDs yeah. and you know and, and so serious people that are you know a part of this. So it's not to be, you know, kind of taken lightly. But at the same time, it's I don't like, think it's, it's not like Sarah and her mates. Then is it? No, no, yeah. definitely not. No. <laughs> uh, and then yeah, quickly. There's th- th- there was one set up in 2005 in uh, New Orleans, um, the New Orleans Vampire Association, uh, Nova for short. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, and that was established in the aftermath of um, Hurricane Katrina. And they all did it. Some the, the the founder thought, well, I want to get all of the local, you know, sort of vampires together in the New Orleans area. Um, this disaster has just happened. We want to rebuild New Orleans. So he was like, I'm going to combine the two. So he basically set up what is essentially a charity, <laughs> a vampire charity, <laughs> a vampire charity for like to help rebuild New Orleans following the, uh, the, the hurricane. So the, yeah, they Excellent. get, they get together and they do fundraisers and they, they helped kind of like rebuild part of the town and oh wow. do and do this, you know, like kind of on the, on the regular. Um, and they've got a number of what they call houses, uh, you know, like some oh, yeah. frat houses, I guess, you know, dotted around the New Orleans area and surrounding areas. And they've all got, you know, quite different names. I did make a note of, you know, a load of them and what they meant and stuff. Obviously, yeah, in the mm. interest of time, I won't be able to cover it. But if anyone is, um, you know, interested or on our socials, I can, yeah, I can share there, the, man. I can share the stuff. Um, even if I do it as like a blog or something. Um, so you've got, yeah, the New Orleans um, Vampire Association and you've got uh, the Atlanta Vampire Alliance. Um, so yeah, if there's, and, and these are real communities of people in the States that believe that they are, a vampire for one reason or another so um yeah it's quite quite interesting so I yeah if anyone wants out. to divulge in that then please do otherwise i'll uh yeah i'll share what i can on the um on the socials excellent but um yeah i think for, for us that's that's it on another episode yeah. It's so, closing, uh, isn't it? yeah i think we've pretty much come off um defense on on this aspect um you know mm. particularly um in terms of what way we'd be more likely to lean although it is all still kind of up in the oh, air really in terms the science of science is still out as she is. says yeah exactly um so yeah so thank you to everyone who's uh come along for the ride and has listened to this one um i, I hope you've uh hope you've enjoyed it we've we've certainly enjoyed bringing oh, this absolutely. uh extra you know sort of content um and uh yeah i'm, I'm sure we'll decide in the, the coming days what the next uh topic will be so uh yeah hopefully you enjoy this one and uh 
keep your ears and eyes open for the next uh, announcement. Indeed. But um, as always, um, you know, a thank you to our uh, beloved patrons, Justin, James, and Monika. Thank you. Uh, much Thank obliged you much. as always. Remember, guys, you can uh, come and join them in this uh, illustrious fan club <laughs> at patreon.com forward slash cryptid ramblers. Um, you'll find us on there. And as Scott said, we've got the uh, the merch store, buythatmerch.co.uk. Um, hit us up. Um, we've got the yeah the, the shaved, shaved the monkey, shaved and, monkey. Uh, and the raging, raging gorgon. gorgon. <laughs> Hopefully keen listeners will uh, <laughs> recognise both of those references. <laughs> Otherwise, it will just sound really weird. <laughs> oh. So, um, yeah, check out the, the website for um, for those if you're interested. We've got other, um, you know, merch as well, mm-hmm. you know, sort of various different designs and, and T-shirts that we launched uh, a few weeks ago. Um, yeah, so please uh, go and t- check it out. And also, we're on the socials. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and, and Facebook mm-hmm. um, under the same handle, Cryptid Ramblers Podcast. So, again, like, share, subscribe, share your stories, encounters, theories opinions you know whatever it may be we want to uh you know we want to hear all of them absolutely so um please get in touch and um i think on on that note it's uh goodbye from me and it's goodbye from me and uh remember this episode was brought to you by the number two (laughs) 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 and the letter v (laughs) 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 (laughs)